I am sorry you married a fool. My only comfort is that he does not share my blood. Drop it! Duncan and Bo Come Correct. Hey everybody, welcome back to Duncan and Bo Come Correct. Uh, this is the final episode, belated as it is, of uh, Duncan and Bo Get Terrified, looking at the terror infamy, episodes 9 and 10. But uh, we're going to do something a little bit different this time, because it has been a while, and also uh, the ending of infamy kind of sucked. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my and that is of course uh duncan mcleish one half of the duncan and Bo come correct team our man in the field yeah but we should also we should also stress that we painstakingly went into forensic detail on these two episodes what the second last week in december yeah we we yeah, like yeah. fully to the point where at the end that we're like we never have to speak about this again this is done. Let's not think about this again. And then you were like, actually. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it was one of the, the it, it doesn't <laughs> happen very often. But every now and again, there will be a technical hiccup. This time around, it was that my end of things recorded just fine. Mm. Your end of things did not record at all. Which... I mean, oh we've recorded like put things in perspective we've been doing this show for about five years and mm -hmm. i can i think this may be only the second time this has ever happened so yeah it, it's not something that's terribly common and it was my own damn fault because at the time the headphones i, were, I was using this was getting into a little bit of the sausage getting made but yeah. i had a usb pair of headphones and for whatever reason plugging those in it wasn't following the audio source and the recorder so it, it just didn't record your your voice which makes for a less interesting show <laughs> i tried like editing it together so that uh there weren't gaps and it was just me doing one long spalding gray ass <laughs> monologue about the terror infamy but uh that did not it, it, as it happens turn out very good because Your version of david lynch interrogating a monkey <laughs> yeah oh shit i mean <laughs> Look, 2020 has been a shitty year already, kind of out of the gate. Some really <laughs> some really frustrating and depressing stuff has happened. Mm. That David Lynch short film, Duncan, is the only thing <laughs> keeping me going right now. I was like, see when it popped up and it was like, David Lynch interrogates some monkey he suspects from murder. I was like, is there some sort of Ransdillian conspiracy going on here? I'll tell you, look, and we're going to talk about this later when we talk about some movies. Because there is a particular director that I feel like I vibrate at that same resonant frequency. And that's mm -hmm. how I feel sometimes with Lynch. You know, because I was thinking about this actually before we recorded today, Duncan. Because sometimes I think even when we're not talking. Oh, and, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, when I get time. Yeah, I'm a busy guy. But, <laughs> but I was thinking just uh, earlier that there are, there are those things that you feel... As soon as you hear them, um, you feel like, well, that I don't even understand this. Mm -hmm. It just makes a weird kind of sense to me. You know, it's that uh, sort of dream logic idea of like, I don't have to logically and rationally be able to connect dots A to B to C to D. I just know that I can get from A to D in my head and somehow or another that fits. You know, like, yeah. like interrogating a monkey that feels... Yes, it's absurd, but that totally fits in my headspace as a thing that ought to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, like like the first time you see Reanimator and the decapitated head eat out Barbara Crampton, you're like, look, I that is a thing that I never thought my head needed. <laughs> but now that I see it, it is a thing that belongs there. You know? Yeah. Like, this, is a, this is a thing that will always be a point of reference. And uh, and that's how I feel about this Lynch monkey thing. It's just like, of course it happened. Of course it's delightful. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> let's get to the bottom of things. <laughs> it's <laughs> smoke. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, there, it, it's just a thing of pure beauty. So yes, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, even even as we talk about how shitty we thought that the end of tear infamy was we we live in a world uh that is uh cold and cynical duncan we do but every we now do. and again david lynch interrogates a monkey 
He will talk to a fucking monkey. <laughs> but he's had a long-standing love affair with monkeys, as we know. Yeah, they, they do make appearances um, in the in the abstract, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so to speak. Yeah, and I mean, I think the short itself was from twenty sixteen, so that would have been about the time he was doing oh, the season uh, three. Yeah, which makes up that makes a ton of sense because it feels like it, it was like a fucking cut scene. From there, the, the, the scene where Agent Lynch interrogates a monkey. Right. Hey, <laughs> we've got the monkey for four days. We only need him for two. Keep the cameras rolling. I, I love the fact as well that we're like, I mean, with the technology we have just now, we could maybe try and make it look like the monkey is actually talking, or we can just sip and impose a human mouth over it. And we'll just superimpose the human mouth over it. I mean, because what does it matter? Either way, it's going to look kind of fakey. So <laughs> just lean into it, you know? Like, that... Again, it, it's one of those things where all the decisions made in that feel natural and right. Yes, as, oh, I... Yeah. As, as bizarre as it is. But yeah, so early... Hey, quick review here, right off the bat, for Duncan and Bo Come Correct... This uh, what oh, fuck? What is the name of it? I don't even remember. I just think of it as the David Lynch monkey movie. Hey, something Jack or yeah, yeah. Know. Let all right, but Jack. I can't remember. <laughs> um, hold on. If I type in David Lynch monkey movie, <laughs> which I really but, wanted, I really wanted to be the name of my college indie rock band. <laughs> like you know, what I mean? it just never happened. Uh, <laughs> David Lynch monkey movie actually immediately takes you, of course, to uh, what did Jack do? That's it. What did Jack do? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> David Lynch interrogating a monkey short film. <laughs> you didn't know you need it until you see it. And then it's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that mattered that week for me. Like I was, I, I, I was in awe of this. I was like, they just like, drop it on, on Netflix on his birthday. Why yeah. Not? Just a, a goof. And I mean, that's that's kind of the beauty of these services. And I know that Lynch himself is is very much against, you know, the small screen experience. I'm sure I heard him once complain about a fucking phone. Yeah. <laughs> but, if, great as well. but if it also means that he's just going to use Netflix as his, like, cleaning out the closet cinematic goodwill, mm-hmm. I'm fine with that, too. Oh, yeah. Know? Yeah, he can put anything on there. Like, I, like, his first constitutional of the day, I would watch that. I like that you refer to it as a constitutional. Um, well, I thought I could get dirty with it, and I thought David Lynch wouldn't appreciate that. So. No. He's a classy guy. He is a classy guy that talks to monkeys. <laughs> as we pointed out, he is he is a man that both enjoys sexual perversity and dad jokes in equal measure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He exists somewhere in between. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, Blue Velvet, I think, is the touchstone to understanding David Lynch himself. I don't think it's his best movie, but I think it's his most, like, psychologically honest movie in a way. I think you know, I've said many times that I think Blue Velvet is a, a weird Rosetta Stone to Lynch's filmography. I mean, it, like, it, it deals with the culmination of it, and I'm with you, I don't think it's his best movie by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it, it lands at his most cynical time and basically informs not only everything that comes after it, but feels like he was always working towards it as well. So uh, it, it's weird, um, but in, in, in totally the best way. And it's, it's a movie that is hella sexually perverse. Um, like in a way where you're like, mm, I don't know about this, uh, but yeah, he's a, he's a he's a guy that I mean, I would love to see him do something else. But if David Lynch tomorrow said he was he was going the John Carpenter route and never doing anything film wise or TV wise again, that man has a filmography back catalog which is. Up there with some of the best that any auteur can ever claim to have, and even the ones that are not ranked as the you know the his best in his catalog are still a damn sight better than the majority of what you will see year to year. So, well, um, and he's interesting in that he's very much an independent film director who mm-hmm. every now and again dips his toe into the mainstream and occasionally 
like nails it. Like he he shows like oh I could make any of these movies. Yeah, you know, yeah. like when he does uh, like Elephant Man and even Dune to an extent, even though that's that's kind of weird or or like the straight story yeah. or something like that, where it's like oh he could make a by the numbers pedestrian Hollywood film and he can do that very well. It's just he chooses to have you know Willem Dafoe's head shot off and pantyhose <laughs> laying in the middle of the street and and the world is the better for it. I, I, I'll put it this way: I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The uh, Guardian, I want to say, in the UK did uh, a poll of the 100 most important movies of um, like the last 25 years in the UK, and it was critics and readers, etc. And number one on that list was Mulholland Drive. So mm, that's a that's a dare, pretty good movie. There you go. So yeah. I mean, and that's a movie that was not critical critically successful in terms of money but like reap the rewards of critics um in terms of uh, you know if, if good reviews equaled you know millions then he, he you know had a blockbuster on his hands but um point of fact it doesn't <laughs> so, <laughs> you know it's very well reviewed heavily underseen um and just and when you take it into account, that was a film TV project they just cobbled together as a movie. <laughs> it's like yeah. A, it's fucking insane. It's like, well, yeah, I've got these. This didn't quite work out as a, I don't really want to lose this kind of TV footage thing I'll do. What I'll do is I'll add a kind of wraparound story to it. And I'll just release it as a movie. And we'll see how it does. Um, most important movie. Of <laughs> it's just nuts. <laughs> right. Oops. I accidentally made a masterpiece. <laughs> David Lynch. That is that's David Lynch. Yeah, I, I genuinely don't think for one second he cares either. Like I, I, I get that feeling that yeah, I think on some level he, he doesn't want people to slam what he's done. But I think as long as he's happy at the end of the process, I think that's probably where the buck stops. Whereas you get a lot, a lot of directors you will see who will be raging against the machine if they get a, a negative review. I just don't think David Lynch is that guy. Yeah, yeah I agree 100% with that. He he seems like... I, 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 yes, I think that in a perfect world, he would love it if everyone saw his work and thought, holy shit, that is the best thing I ever saw. Yeah. But, but he is fine if he's the one saying that you know yeah like, like you know to to the betterment of his films like he is it, i don't think you can watch a david lynch movie and come away from it thinking like boy i'd really like to see the director's cut when we get the uncompromised vision <laughs> you know like <laughs> <laughs> nobody yeah, saying just... release the lynch cut of season yeah. three you know i think the thing is is <laughs> like like to me the evidence of i'm not really kind of caring is the point of the point of view that he never explains anything yeah like well, it would be very easy for him to sit there and say well actually Mulholland Drive means this you know what I mean like and then I, I imagine people that were maybe of the opinion that it, they, you know they want to love it but they just can't quite work it out would very easily jump to say it's like in their mind it's a masterpiece but the fact he's like no, like I will not explain this. The movie is what it is. Um, the fact that he would see something like Lost Highway, is, you know, just his interpretation of the OJ trial, you know, yeah, <laughs> what the fuck? Right, it's just the OJ trial trial filtered through the prism of of Lynch's head. You just like sitting there going, "What does that mean?" Yeah, <laughs> like, like, yeah. There you go, uh, Lynch. Hey, hey, you know what's not in my notes? David Lynch movies. Um, so what well, is in your notes? <laughs> here, here's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna talk about Infamy uh, nine and ten. We're gonna get that out of the way. Then we got a couple of questions for Duncan and Bo Get Deep, the the most popular, just rocking into the top of the list uh, segment that we've we've done here on the show, uh, nice. where where we answer the burning questions of the day. Yes, and and there are a ton. I don't, Duncan. Did you hear about this Brexit thing? <laughs> Stuff like that. That's the kind of thing you you can expect to hear. If that's a question, I, no, I don't know. It's not, in fact, a, a question. That's more a question I had. Um, 
<laughs> and you're never going to believe who the president is. But <laughs> hey, I don't want to spoil that segment. Um, <laughs> the answer may surprise you. Um, and what then, year is it? <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Can we watch that right now? Let's just um, the recording. Yeah, just right. that. Oh, man. Oh boy, yeah, I, I have been thinking about that season a lot lately. Uh, it I, it's about time for me to go back and revisit uh, season three. I do believe. Um, mm-hmm. it, I mean, you just can't go wrong. There, it, that's never a bad choice. No, unlike episodes nine and ten of the terrible. Uh, all right, so but on the back end of all this, we're going to talk about some more movies we saw and uh, do a real. You and I have both seen some some heavy hitters of late. Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've, I've, in the last week and a half, I've seen two movies that I would say are what I would class as masterpieces. So, yeah. I, I, man, I got to tell you, but not not to get ahead of ourselves, but last night I sat down with the director's cut of Doctor Sleep. And, oh, nice! And I got to tell you, um, I love Doctor Sleep. I thought the mm-hmm. theatrical version of it was. Uh, was tremendous and i think the um the the director's cuts even better i'm looking forward to it. i've got on um, pre-order it's not out in the uk for i want to say about another month but i'm very much like i didn't i didn't love it as much as you loved it um and i have a couple of issues with it but i understand why they're there mm-hmm. um but i'm you know any any chance to take an extended look into flanagan's mind makes me happy so yeah can't wait for that <laughs> yeah and it, it there were things about the theatrical cut uh that i i still loved it um i thought it it did a pretty poor job of introducing abra's character Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think the director's cut does a much better job of easing you into this idea of, of her being supernatural and whatnot. Anyway, uh, but we're going to, we're going to talk about that on the back end. Um, uh, probably not a ton more with Dr. Sleep, but you know, did you enjoy it? Did you come away from it feeling positive yeah, I, or, or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think it's, <clears throat> I don't think it's Flanagan's best movie, but I, I mean, I, I really enjoyed my, my only issues and what kind of knocked it down for me a little bit was I felt we spent a bit too much time recreating iconic scenes from Kubrick's The Shining and I know why he did it and I think his his version of doing it was painstakingly perfect it's just like I've seen that movie you know what I mean yeah. I've, I've yeah I've, I've done those scenes before and those scenes like I don't think I don't think he recreated them in a way which was lesser but i don't think he did anything that made them better and like whereas all the stuff with the true knot um to me was just fucking amazing and i wanted so much more of that and i, I kind of felt like in by getting the the original i don't adapted movie and the you know and and the king book and even kind of closing out the movie as a way and i don't cynically think he did this but closing it away in the movie which kind of fixes the issues that stephen king had with the 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 kubrick version uh, just felt a little bit bit disingenuous for me the fact that it ends like the book ends the shining book ends just felt a bit do you remember because i i don't recall this so i'm I'm genuinely asking this in the theatrical version of dr sleep is it broken up into chapters i don't recall that it's not it's no no it's definitely not it's definitely not so the the (laughs) the director's cut is and in oh, much right. the way, much the same way that uh, the book is, where uh, it follows the same sections of like Empty Devils is one of the chapters, and and directly pulled from the book. But the final chapter of the movie is what was forgotten, yeah. which is the title of the final chapter of the original Shining. So yeah. I don't think it. I don't think Flanagan was doing it to make King feel good. I think Flanagan yeah. genuinely was like you know what's a kick-ass ending? And then just rolled it into Dr. Sleep. 
Yeah. I never liked the ending to the book. I, it was my, it was always my thing about the. I love The Shining as a book, but I never liked the idea of well, he just, he, you know, he went so mad that he forgot to look after the hotel, so it burned down. To me, the ending of the movie is so much more rad. <laughs> it's like it's a horror ending. You know, yeah. the ending to the movie is like there's nothing more terrifying than being chased by your wounded psychotic dad through a fucking maze. You know, I mean? like that's that to me is where it's at. Um, and like it's, I, I didn't dislike it. I just when, when the ending happened, I thought, mm. and then you know, I, I, to me. Like I see, the first two thirds of Doctor Sleep are, I think, out and out Flanagan's best work, like hands down. And then the last third is good. I mean, it's really, really good, but it just remind it reminded me. Like you never want to be sitting watching someone's work and be reminded of what the better movie, know. right? Yeah, but just kind of how I felt. Like oh, The Shining for me is like like unimpeachable is is maybe it's between that and the thing as being my favorite movie he ever fucking made. So I walk in with that baggage to watch that movie and I loved so much about what they did do with it. I, I felt he cut corners that I'm really hoping a uh, snake bite, whatever her face is, uh, I hope we get more of her story in the director's cut because she's really fleshed out as a character in the book and a really yeah. interesting character in the book. And I just felt like we get a little kind of nod of why she's doing the things without like actually going into detail. And I think the detail makes her a more sympathetic character to begin with, who becomes corrupted over time. And she's just not that in the movie at all. She's just like, all right, you're a you're you're quite a horrible character. And yeah, horrible things will happen to you later on. You know what I mean? It's yeah. the transformation is too quick in film. I understand why, because the book's fucking huge. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like all King books, you have to condense it down somewhere, but and it's never going to be your version. You know what I mean? Like you you're going especially oh. if you've read the book, there's certain things you're gonna want to see on screen. But like I say, I, I, I mean I think it's a, I th it was in my top. I want to say it was in my top 10. Was it in my top 10? It was maybe just out with my top 10 uh, for the year. But I thought it was a, a, of cinematic horror experiences. It was a thumping good one. There was plenty in there that made me smile. My wife said to me that, like, when that shot goes over, like, the, the kind of dark lake head. Oh, sure. The over, boom, like, and the, boom, yeah. boom, boom, she said she, 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 she said she turned around to look at me, and she said, I, like, she, like I was smiling like from ear to ear and just not blinking and just staring at the screen and taking everything in. And I mean, I don't often do that when I go to the cinema. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was, there was a lot. I, I just, like I say, there was bits where, that's why I'm looking forward to the director's cut because I'm hoping stuff that's fleshed out is more in that first two thirds as opposed to the back end of the movie because the first two thirds is the bit that I want to spend yeah. my time with if that makes sense yeah, and there is that is where the bulk of the new stuff is, yeah. is i'll be over the moon the, then the yeah although there is one an extension within the overlook that i'll not spoil for you but just you know briefly allude to here so one of my favorite scenes in any movie <laughs> i saw last year was the scene with dan towards talking to his father as the new bartender at the overlook oh yeah fucking love that scene mm -hmm. and there is a back end to that scene that takes place in the bathroom much oh, right. like the original shining with lloyd and it, yep. it and it expands on that conversation in a way that i really liked so ah. it's like you know there there's stuff peppered all through it but Man, I just, again, just sitting down for, you know, the three hours or three and a half hours, whatever the director's cut is, and just letting that story happen yeah, is so satisfying. And there's, I'll tell you what, what there's a, a bunch, not a bunch of, but a, enough of that it felt like it mattered more in the director's cut is sort of his relationship with his mother and her concern for him. Mm -hmm. and and you know seeing alex esso starry eyes alex esso as she's fucking brilliant and, and i mean that is genius casting by the way like absolute on point genius casting yeah. it's it's so good and again who the fuck knew henry thomas could do <laughs> fucking anything his his nicholson it's not an impression but there's there's a nicholson quality to it that oh, yeah. is is I'm so glad they did that instead of trying to digitize it or some shit. 
I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. The I'll tell you right now, like the spirit of Scatman Carruthers is alive. No <laughs> shit, man, that uh, was it, awesome. Like, that to me is the bit where, like, between that and um, um, Alex Esso, I was kind of like double, kind of double taken when I was seeing certain things going. This is trippy and weird. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I, the, like really weird. Uh, but yeah, I was I was with you on that one. I I, I don't think. Like the last thing you want is there are plenty of people out there that do Nichols and impressions, but the uh, to me there was something slightly more kind of real, grounded, and weirdly sympathetic. If you know what I mean about his portrayal of Nicholson off the back of you know Danny's time at the EA saying you know this tokens for my dad because you know I managed yeah. to do the thing that he didn't do. Like there's, there's so many elements of it that I really, really, really liked. Um, I th- and we'll talk I, I again after you see the director's cut because I really think you're gonna like the stuff that's added. I can't and wait. It may not. It may not be enough to really tip the scales as as to your overall opinion of the film, but I I think all of it, everything that they cut out, I was like, it. This would have made the movie better. Yeah, um, I think it's it's one of those things as well. Though I can I I understand why studios are like, listen, we need to keep this one because I mean it was a two and a half hour movie anyway. Yeah. I want to see. Well, Flanagan so, just wants to make everything ten hours, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am I am fine with that. I just imagine that you know, like when you we live in this brilliant time now, though. That can you imagine, like. Like, how long did you have to wait to get like something like the final cut of Blade Runner? I mean, it had been yeah. released like three times before as different cuts before you finally got that final cut. Um, we now live in a world where it is a given, the same with It Chapter 2, it is a given that when the movie comes out, like when the Blu-ray comes out, there's a very good chance you're just going to get that director's cut in there anyway. Um, you know, so the, the days of like having to like sit there and go, oh, will we ever get to see the cabal cut of Nightbreed are gone now. Like these directors can like almost, as long as the movie makes money, can hold court and say, you know what, Blu-ray allows us opportunity to put out both cuts. Doesn't harm the studio in any way, shape or form. If anything, it adds to the need to purchase the physical media. So, um, I mean, that, that to me is exciting. And I, I, I want... I think the movie I don't think necessarily made as much money as he expected it to, but it, it made a lot of money. <laughs> like that, that that made a lot of money, and it was just it was great to see what he that is his biggest movie by far, and it's great to mm-hmm. see him work on that scale, and it didn't feel like he was out his depth. No, no, consider it's a massive jump considering dude, to working on Absentia. So that scene of um, Rose the Hat flying from abra's bedroom back into yeah. her body that whole it's sequence was like fuck that's cool yeah it's amazing um, i watched a couple <laughs> of times the moment where her body kind of gets sucked back or her soul kind of gets sucked back into her body and mm-hmm. she gets knocked off the top of the the rv and it's like man that is an awesome effect it is yeah, really it, good and it didn't like i was shocked by the like the the scene preceding that where her arm gets fucked up yeah it's a real and gerald's the, game he's like remember like, this he's just like, he's just like, literally what i thought he's like that yeah hand trauma let's do it uh-huh <laughs> yeah i've mastered this i don't know if you saw my previous movie um i'd be like yeah all that stuff was like it was it was rad it just made, it made me very very happy and he's finally getting the recognition that i personally feel he should have got right back I can't stress enough. To me, Absentia is a fucking incredible yeah. movie, and he should have got the he should have got all the accolades then. The fact he had to go off and do stuff for Netflix and whatnot just so he can get movies out to me is a crying shame, uh, an indictment on, on 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 where we are sometimes with horror, where it's just like, oh yeah, well, God forbid we give you know directors the opportunity to make original movies. We need to lock them down to do like franchise work of what she has had to do so um yeah i don't know everything about it was was like yeah I, I was i was a happy guy i'm looking forward to the director's cut i don't think like i say i don't think it's his best work but i mean as as a sequel to the shining having seen that tv movie the shining um <laughs> you know what i mean fuck that up 
you know, it's very easy to put that up, and he didn't do that at all. He stayed the course and he delivered something which was a grand, huge, um, engaging, and incredible. So. Have you have you watched? Uh, the Haunting of Hill House yet? Of course not. What the <laughs> fuck is wrong with you? I swear, one of these days you're gonna watch it, and and again, the only, you're not hurting me. <laughs> you you are ignoring one of your favorite director's best work. I know, I know. I will. I the thing is though, I know I will watch it. I know that I will find the pocket of time that, and I it might very well come um, this summer because my my wife has uh, taken the wee one away with my mother actually to mexico for like 10 days and that to me is you know i'm going to take some time off work and it's just gonna be me in the house with the dogs and i know for a fact i'll do i'll just pick i'll, I'll pick a tuesday and i'll go that right today's the haunted hell is and i'll watch it i'll binge it all um in a day i, I know that's, what i'm like that's a rough that's, day man i mean I you're gonna, you will be emotionally spent I want that though. That's yeah. how I like to spend my and, time off work. <laughs> and if I can give you uh, one one other piece of advice here, mm-hmm. is you should uh, you should get the the Blu-ray and watch the extended cuts of the, those episodes. The I wouldn't do the Netflix. Oh, you nice. can, but I would I would do the extended uh, versions. It, again, it's stuff that isn't necessary to your overall enjoyment of the film. Uh, or of the series, but I think all of it added a little bit of atmosphere and texture uh-huh. that when you're already 10 hours in, it's like uh, another 20, 30 minutes of, oh, let's let's look into this corner of the house kind of stuff. Uh, I found really, really good. Um, it's, man, that's so, god damn, the, the first episode of hill house i you know i watched it again not over halloween and that first episode is such a fucking winner Ugh. and then the, the <laughs> and but but that like that's to say that first episode is great and then there's that run of episodes like four or five and six the middle the dark middle chapters of the series they're like oh this is the best horror television that was that's ever been made okay mm. okay got it <laughs> the, well well done mike flanagan um <laughs> So oh, fuck, he's he truly is he like to me he is the modern car carpenter. He yeah, is, he's he is carpenter of the twenty first century. Um, hey, let's talk about the terror infamy uh, in a segment <laughs> that we are calling. Hey, remember that this happened in the terror infamy. <laughs> so I'm gonna basically skim through my notes here, and and you stop me when you remember something being especially stupid. <laughs> So here's what happens in, in episode nine. Uh, this is where they shut the camp down. Oh yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And they they get everybody on some buses, and uh, also everybody's like, "Hey, what the fuck ever happened to C. Thomas Hell? He didn't show up for our big <laughs> departure." And Amy Yoshida, who, as we know, fucking murdered him, is just like, "I don't know." <laughs> so- <laughs> Yeah, you would think you would think in in a in a situation where you know you're in a chain of command, duty, loyalty, no man should be left behind. You would think his colleagues would be like, "You know, the guy that was in charge of this base, you don't think he should be here?" Yeah, you know what I mean, maybe maybe we should look for him. You're right now, everybody's like, "Ah, fuck that guy. Let's get out of here." And <laughs> <laughs> so they do they take off and uh they get home to terminal island and the whole place has just been bulldozed and that's right fuck i forgot all about that right so so then we cut to six months after all that and henry um is gardening for his <gasps> boss <laughs> where the, his boss is like hey you know I know you people are supposed to be real good at gardening, but you seem kind of shit at it, Henry. <laughs> and Henry's like, oh, I'll do better. And he's like, okay, you know, it's cool and all. It's it's nice having my own, uh, what do they call them, slaves, I think. <laughs> That's real cool. <laughs> but, you know, don't fuck These it up. These plants should be a foot apart or something. That's something right. He makes them move that. the plants because they need to be, they're too close together. 
Ah, it's a hole we're painting the roses red. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> so um, then um, uh, his wife, Hosko, is uh, tossing flowers off a bridge. And this is where we get the uh, the revela- revelation that, um, it, you know, she says this is all her fault that Yuko has gone oh, all bananas. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Fuck. Right. Like, remember this stupid thing that happened? Yeah, so- right at the very end pivotal information which she's been holding and judging everyone else against and then all of a sudden just comes to the realization actually it might be her fault all along one episode from the end yes oh so fuck this story man fuck i know it. i know so um henry gets a phone call they're like sleeping in some skid row like tenement uh, along with a bunch of other uh people from the camp and he gets a phone call from late at night and of course it's dumbass chester fuck chester man and chester immediately is like hey pop don't hang up even though you absolutely should because i've been an asshole to you (laughs) this entire (laughs) entire season yeah remember when i said that you weren't my real dad and remember that time when i was like that you know i'm not cursed and clearly i'm cursed and let's remember back to the first episode when i'm giving you shit about your own boat on your boat (laughs) and just being a dick from jump how about that, folks? <laughs> Remember the time I stole that car that you gave away honorably, but, you know, like, uh, and tried to keep honor, like, and I just stole it. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm a thief. <laughs> Remember when I planted crack on mom so I could avoid having to do that turn in county? <laughs> <laughs> Chester sucks. Such a bad son. And so, but he, he calls up uh, his dad. And he's just like, hey, me and Luz got married. And uh, as it, like, there's some voiceover narration as he's, you know, like, hey, I know that you're mad at me and whatnot. But, like, Osco and, and Henry show up. And, in fact, Henry's line to Chester is, I'm sure my wife will insist that we go. You oh, it's s- such a good line. <laughs> fucking piece of shit, Chester. <laughs> And when Henry shows up, his first line to lose is, I'm sorry you married a fool. Yep. And that the one comfort he has is that Chester does not share his blood. Fuck you, Chester. (laughs) That is bold. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, yeah. And and it's it's earned every single second of it. He sucks. And and so Jiru, who was... Hen- not Henry Chester's brother from the picture. <laughs> yeah, remember that? It's yeah, detail that just suddenly happened. So Yuko sw- stole him from the photograph. Yep, uh, stole him from a picture. <laughs> so now, now giving her the child that she always wanted. Um, and then little Jiro is like, "Hey, is Taizo okay?" And Yuko is like, "Shut up, shut up. We're gonna have a baby Taizo soon." And she's got like a little crib. <laughs> And so a priest shows up at Luz's mom's house. Chester's got a gun and they've got this little whistle password that they use. Mm -hmm. And so the priest does that. They let him in. Um, Osco is looking at the empty picture and then uh, has a flashback of playing Go. Mm -hmm. And she then she asks, like, did Jiro seem clever? So Chester reveals that his whole plan in all of this business is to just go on the run with his pregnant and or, you know, uh, wife that has just had a baby and an infant and just stay on the run until yeah. he's like, well, the, when the kid grows up, then I'll know he's safe. And Henry is watching this whole thing. and But you can tell he's just like, oh, what a f- stupid fucking idea. Well, because remember, remember it worked for him when he traveled to the other side of the world to fight the war. Right. This is the equivalent of that scene that I hate so much in Super 8, um, (laughs) where they're firing a bunch of rockets at the alien monster, Mm -hmm. and they're like, I don't know, something about his electric field or whatever, it keeps making the rockets go crazy and hit everything but him. Keep firing rockets then. (laughs) Holy shit, is this the dumbest military ever on the face of the planet? Um, Keep fighting, assholes. <laughs> right. It's so stupid. It, like, yeah, so Chester's play is just like, we're, we're going to drive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, it's fucking Mad Max. And 
So, like, Chester's packing up his car. He's like, as soon as this kid drops, we're going to throw it in the back and get going. And so Chester, like, takes another swipe at talking to Henry. And Henry's like, look, Yuko is going to keep coming. Like, you remember when you went across the world? Uh, Like, Duncan said it just, like, two seconds ago. And (laughs) Chester's like, oh, no. And (laughs) maybe. And Henry is like, running away is not the answer here. And why did you go back to lose in the first place? All you're doing is bringing her misery. Like shit follows you everywhere, Chester. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I know that you know that you can't outrun a demon. So what aren't you telling me? And then Luz goes into labor. Uh, there's another knock at the door. Um, it's the priest again. And the, he whistles the password and they let him back in. And, but as soon as this priest touches Luz's belly and starts massaging it, everybody's like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> does that priest seem creepy to you? And so they just grab him. There's a real, like, get her moment. <laughs> get her! Yeah, they just grab this priest and they lock the doors of the room where Luz is having the baby. And then they just throw her in the back of this fucking car and take off. Hmm. So Chester drives them to this government facility that's built into the mountainside, like a, a, a secret nuclear or atomic bomb testing facility uh, or development facility. And mm-hmm. Luz immediately is like, this place feels like death. And I should know being the mistress of death and all. And, <laughs> and Chester is like, Hey, as soon as this uh, this baby's born, we're going to blow this popsicle stand, so don't sweat it. You just pop out that baby, and we're going to hit the road. You remember my plan of just driving endlessly? I think it's going to be pretty good for everybody. Ugh. And so uh, she has the baby. Um, Henry and Chester uh, chit-chat some more, and it turns out that Chester's plan is uh is to basically sacrifice himself so that Yuko will take him instead of his child and then the baby and Luz will be free to you know grow up and live and whatnot yeah just like whilst he I think thinks that that is the most selfless act it is also the most selfish act yeah well it also puts him in a position where he he can't ever defend them yeah you know and to assume that Yuko, who, by the way, had forgotten about a kid that she had in the first place. Oh, yes. And yep. was just like, like she's not going to, she's just going to get baby hungry. You know what I mean? It's like her, her supernatural biological talk, clock is ticking. <laughs> like this. And she's got to, you know, wrangle as many babies as she can. Yep. All from foes. Yes. So. <laughs> right. She is, she is stalking photo albums stealing kids right out of their polaroids so and then <laughs> so Luz has this baby and it uh it turns out that uh yuko like possessed Luz, mm-hmm. and um or the baby like it's staring at her like Luz is like the baby's staring at me like he has a secret and then says, it's Yuko, Yuko's in the baby. And meanwhile, outside, there's a fat Englishman drunk roaming around and is mm-hmm. like wants to see Chester's badge and shit. And then Hen- Henry just knocks this guy out uh, so that they can hit the road. Don't worry, that don't come of nothing. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and then the baby does start crying and Luz's mom takes the baby from her. And it turns out that Yuko was in the mom. Yep. And, and then... The <laughs> Yeah, Asko then uh, confronts Luz's mom, a.k.a. Yuko, a.k.a. her sister, Mm -hmm. and says, look, I was the one who betrayed you most of all, and uh, apparently Asko swapped the men that they were going to be with because she heard that Furuya, the guy who ended up killing Yuko, or uh, uh, turning Yuko away, um that she heard hey Furuya is kind of a jerk so how about you my sister go with this guy and i'm gonna go with uh miss uh, henry nakayama over here who seems like a pretty cool dude with what has his own fishing boat and 
Osco basically says, like, I had the life you were supposed to have, and you know what? I'd do it all again because Yuko, you suck. And which <laughs> seems unnecessarily antagonistic. <laughs> but <laughs> Oh so good. <laughs> and then oh. Uh, so we catch up to him and uh, like our heroes catch up to him and Osco and Luz's mom are both bloody. And Osco says, I don't know where L- Luz or the baby have gone to. So this is where Chester goes looking for. Her, and the, sh- the episode ends with Luz possessed by Yuko walking down the road with the baby. Ugh. So that is episode nine. Ugh. <laughs> right. Yet another revelation. Like we had... Um, oh, by the way, Chester has a brother. Oh, by the way, this is, uh, Yuko is going to steal this baby from a picture now. (laughs) Oh, also Luz is pregnant again. And so now Yuko wants that baby like she did in the first part of the season. Eh, All right. So let's just finish this up. Mm -hmm. So we get, uh, George Takei. Uh, th- this is probably the one of the coolest shots in, in the final episodes. It's him standing on a road and he sees um, a bunch of people lined up there. He sees a, a guy in the distance and he's like, oh, this is an old friend. And he's like, hey, how's the afterlife? And, <laughs> oh, God. and the guy is like, hey, uh, yeah. you know, I just died and I was working at Hiroshima. And he says, yeah, I, I had, you know, my wife and my kids. And they're all here too. And the camera kind of moves a little bit. And you see that there's this line of people behind this guy. And Takei is like, oh my, Mm -hmm. there's a lot here. And (laughs) (laughs) like one of the girls has a burned face. And then Takei wakes up. Like he has a, 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 a nightmare that he's waking up from. And then you realize that there's a celebration going on outside. And everybody's out. Uh, celebrating the fact that these bombs dropped on uh, uh, the, the the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Mm-hmm. So we cut away from that, which is far and away the more interesting thing happening in this episode to Luz, who is walking down the road at night with her baby and singing in Japanese. What with her being possessed and all by Yuko and a car pulls up and asks if she needs a ride. Uh, so they take her. Uh, she says she's headed to, a, a, a goyo a guayo something like that and they're like that's right yeah yeah and they're like hey we can take you and hey jump in because look we got a baby in the back seat too isn't that cool and <laughs> come on in you're just a not not in any way of possessed japanese demon or nothing just <laughs> have a seat just uh push the baby aside and make room for you and your baby uh it's not weird that you're just wandering down the middle of the road or nothing um and also speaking in japanese although you're clearly not weird no Mm. Hmm. Hmm. A lot of things don't add up here, but I'm going to take it with a great assault. <laughs> so, so then Henry and Chester and then, uh, uh, like Amy Yoshida and, and those folks or no, no, no. It's Henry and Chester and Osco. And I think the mother, um, yeah. show up and Henry and Chester, um, asked to borrow Hector's truck, who is one of the, one of Luz's family members. And there are spirit scrolls, it happens, in all of his pockets. And Hector tells him to be careful and ask Chester if he knows where Hiroshima is. And Chester's like, the fuck are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, it turns out there was something big in Hiroshima. And Chester's like, I can't worry about that right now. I got a Japanese demon on my mind. And <laughs> can't solve the world's problems. Can't even solve my own problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so osco is then uh she's like oh we knew a lot of people in hiroshima is kind of talk about that with henry as he's driving mm-hmm. and he says hey i confess to yuko about you know what i did by kind of parent trapping her with uh mr furuya yeah. and um osco is like you know i don't know why she didn't just rip me to shreds after i told her that but I'm pretty sure she's going to want to kill me the next time I see her. Yeah. <laughs> so, which is truly, according to my notes, the entire conversation in that car. So, yeah, pretty much. 
Uh, so then we we go to Chester, who uh, is in his car, and he finds Luz, who is now unpossessed. And Lou says, oh, the the Yure has taken our new baby. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. no shit. But <laughs> more importantly, who is now possessed? And so Osco and, and Henry find the car that she was in, and they find the couple dead, and the back seat's empty, except for stuffed animals. Mm-hmm. So the daughter, the little girl that was in the back seat, is Yuko now, and she's taking the baby back to a barn that's got Japanese characters like carved into everything. And Yuko's busted ass body is there under a tarp. And the daughter like arranges Yuko's arms around the baby, like, you know, getting everything ready. Mm -hmm. And so George Takei, meanwhile, and Amy Yoshida are watching a bunch of people celebrating, you know, in, in the Skid Row tenement area. And Amy says, you know, I wanted revenge once, but getting it didn't make me feel any better. I mean, didn't make her feel any better, did it? I, you know, she's alive, <laughs> and see, Thomas Howell sure as fuck isn't. I would say he's it not a, it anymore, <laughs> right? I would say it accomplished something. And, <laughs> and but and George Takei wisely is like, Amy, he would have <laughs> killed you. <laughs> 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 and he basically says look it was you or him and nobody knows but like us uh, the the japanese who were in that camp mm-hmm. and Takei says you know i've cried more tears since leaving the camp because of everything that's gone now yeah and it's a nice moment like again the most interesting stuff that's happening is hearing george Takei comment on the political and social happenings of the day and the and, yeah. which is not but where don't... you want to be no, I've also don't get into a position where you're like that. This George Takei is really turning in an incredible, sobering performance without any sort of hints of wink, wink, nudge to the audience because we will undo that before this episode is done. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> so <sighs> I don't know exactly what this means, Duncan, but my note here is Lou says the baby crazies. <laughs> So Chester takes off after confirming, like, Hector hasn't called any police yet, despite the fact that bodies are starting to pile up in in this business. Mm-hmm. And, and authorities probably should be called at some point. But uh, Chester and uh, Hector and Osco, like, go to examine the car. Keep in mind, this is the finale. So we found this this car with the dead bodies. So now we're just going back to the car with the dead bodies. and. Yeah. The, then this little girl that what was possessed comes walking out of the woods crying, saying that she didn't do it. And Chester says, you know what? I'll take this little bitch to the doctor once she says what happened. <laughs> Not before. She's like, I'm sick. I wear my parents. I need to go to the doctor. He's like, hey. <laughs> I need some answers first. <laughs> you want me to take you downtown? Is that what you want? <laughs> little missy? What's the thing here, you see? <laughs> You're going to be riding the lightning, see? <laughs> All I see is a little girl with no baby. You tell me where the baby is, and maybe I can put in a good word with the judge. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be you and old Sparky before the end of the year. <laughs> Read all about it, old Sparky for woman missing the baby. <laughs> I'm only seven. <laughs> Tell that to the judge. I've seen him send younger and dumber <laughs> straight to the chair. The one thing you got going for you is you got some good gams. I'm a child. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, Duncan. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> after ooh. Chester puts the screws to this child <laughs> we see Yuko like prepping the baby and she's talking about like burying them both seems difficult <laughs> and then Luz who is off her fucking nut is looking at some pictures and Osco is like you know I wouldn't stare at pictures of your children I'd keep your mind on other things right now Mm-hmm. And she's like, "Hey, can I have some broth?" 
And Oscar's <laughs> like, hmm, you haven't asked me to leave the room in a while. I should probably go. And it's, <laughs> it's pretty clear that Luz is like, hey, I could do this little picture trick too. Yep. So she finds a picture of Yuko in Osco stuff. And Osco shows up and is like, hey, what are you doing going through all my shit? And why are you looking at this picture of my s- demon sister all crazy like? Mm-hmm. And then we get this flashback of what happened in the picture, which is Osco helping Yuko get dressed up for a trip to America. Knowing full well, she's like, oh, this guy, she is about to fall into the arms of an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> and Osco is like, hey, look at this fancy Viewmaster you've got of the city that Furuya sent you. And I heard he's a real good guy. That's what I heard, Yuko. And she's like, oh, oh, Osco, you're too good to me. It's all stupid. And then Chester and Henry track Yuko down. Uh, Henry says he hasn't forgotten the picture. And uh, I don't know what that means. And then Chester heads in. <laughs> And look, they did these notes a long time ago, and I'm gonna, I wasn't going to watch it again. And uh, Chester heads in uh, with a gun, and it turns out that the writing on the walls of this barn are the names of all of Yuko and Chester's ancestors. Mm. And Chester, catching up to the rest of the show, is like, I think she's preparing for some kind of burial. <laughs> you know, oh fuck thanks chester so he he recognizes these limestone rocks and he says look i know uh the way to the quarry where these limestone rocks came from and henry's like there's got to be a better way and chester's like fuck you old man there's no time and uh also you should have gotten this picture to abuela oh it's a picture of him to suck him into the world or whatever Mm-hmm. And so Luz and Osco are out to hunt for Yoko as uh, Yuko as well. Not Yoko. Uh, <laughs> oh, Yoko. So Luz and Osco <laughs> are hunting for Yuko. And they find her at the edge of, of the grave with a baby. And Yuko is like, this baby will have a different name in the afterlife. So it can never be called back. And they're like, I don't think that's how it works. Like, you just... <laughs> you, they're like, I, I named him and I said no backsies. So I think he's officially named now. That's well, I don't know if you knew that, but that that's that that's as as good as going to the judge. That's it. Look, I don't have kids, Duncan. I don't I don't know the process, but I think what you do is say, This kid's name is Jeff, no backsies. And they're like, Jeff it is. Let let it be known throughout the land. Welcome, Jeff. <laughs> as I bang my gavel, let it be so Yeah. So let it be written, so let it be Jeff. (laughs) So, anyway. So Chester shows up and is like, hey, Yuko, look, it's me, Taizo. And Yuko's like, you're not Taizo anymore. You're old and busted and stupid. And (laughs) Chester's like, no, 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 no. I can reunite you with the boy version of me. And she's like, uh, I'll allow it go on (laughs) and chester's like hey my dad has a picture and she's like no 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 your father died before you know you ever knew him but here comes henry nonetheless to save the day and shows her the picture uh of of a young uh i think it's a picture of like taizo and and jiru i think is the picture in question and he's like look at this i got a picture that you can steal another baby out of and she's like, ooh, you know how I like that. <laughs> and, and then Henry says, you know, but I'm not going to allow my mistakes to cause any more suffering. And then he <laughs> tears the picture in half. And then fuck- here's a picture in half. There's a, there's a whole series of cops behind him as well. And he goes, he's got a gun! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just and they would just fucking shoot Yuko. <laughs> And he gives Chester the one of these sutra sc- scrolls, and he's like, yeah. "Don't let this go." And like, look at me, don't let this go, Chester. <laughs> yeah. Now I know you have sometimes a bit of an issue following the things I tell you, uh, even when I say they're really important, and you nod and you pretend that you that you you have an interest, and you will do what I'm asking you. But what I'm saying is, don't let this go. Got it. Don't don't let this go unless someone asks. Nope. Nope. <laughs> let this go. What? <laughs> so 
Henry then uh, has this band around his arm that's got, you know, some ancient mystical writings on it as well. So he writes on her skin so that she's trapped in her body. And then she claws off the skin where she's been written on so she can possess Henry, which in a different show would have been cool if we had gotten to that by this point. Yeah, had, had we found this power, I don't know, maybe in episode three, I would have been in. Yeah, yeah. Back when the show was still kind of good. And yeah. then Henry then shoots Chester in the leg and then turns the gun on himself, which blows a hole through the middle of him, which mm-hmm. is pretty cool. And then Henry is still alive, but Yuko now has the baby and is like, time to beat feet. He's <laughs> <laughs> so nice. I'm not dead i'm just very badly shot (laughs) right you guys just like you know (laughs) time to do the old skiddly do and (laughs) she's like wait a second i don't even need to run here he's shot a hole in them and shot his son in the leg (laughs) right like i'm good i've just got to get back to my secret garden yep and uh and then i'm good and there is a pretty hilarious cut to just jiro hanging out in this garden like mm. the guy in the cab from the movie Airplane, <laughs> where it's just like, hello? Hello? <laughs> and then they cut away from him, and it's just like, hey, remember this kid from yeah. the picture? I, don't know, I guess. But, hey, remember this kid you only found out about last episode? <laughs> You're right. Just like, oh, who could give a shit? And so then Osco shows up to see Henry blown nearly in half by the grave. Yep. <laughs> Yuko then drags herself out of said grave after Henry has defiled it. Yeah. And the sutra sc- uh, scrolls, Chester says, have trapped the spirit. And he says, look, she's never going to give up. And while Luz is is praying and doing her photo thing, Chester is talking to her about the picture that are uh, to uh, uh, Yuko, the picture she would send to Furuya, and how that is uh, Yuko's perfect moment. Yeah, and says, "Look, we'll go together. We'll like uh, in, into that picture." And he gives her a cup of tea, and Osco then gives Chester a locket, and Chester takes Yuko's hand, and then leaves waves the smoking bundle of sage and she's praying to do her thing uh chester and yuko then go to her happy place which is like getting the picture taken the day that like osco was giving her the business by like oh get wait till you meet mr Furuya. yeah <laughs> and and chester points out to yuko like hey you were pregnant with your sons even even then like you had the family in this moment yeah. And Yuko is like, oh, I do want to stay here. And then she disappears from the picture. And then Chester wakes up with Luz and the baby. And Osco watches all of this looking bummed out about the fact that she has lost her husband. Yep. And the rest of these idiots seem to be fine. Yes. And Makes sense. Yeah. Then we have a moment where it's Chester on the boat with Henry. With Henry posing while Chester takes a picture of him. And Henry tells Chester, like, you know, I became a fisherman because I could leave the world behind. And I waited a long time to get married. But when I did, I named this boat Taro, which means firstborn son. And that when I held Chester, I had the same calm that I did on the sea. And uh, which is a, a nice moment. And he's like, you know, Chester you want to go sailing with me? And we just keep on sailing. And Chester's like, fuck that. You're dead, old man. I got to get <laughs> off this death boat. Otherwise I'm dead too. Just like this, just like this idea of staying on the boat. And it's like a recreation of that scene from Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. I don't know where we're going. Right. <laughs> yeah. And Chester just like, he like takes another picture and he's like, all right, bye dad. You're fucking dead. And, <laughs> And sure enough, we cut straight to Henry's funeral and the picture that Chester took is, is sitting on the coffin Mm -hmm. and Chester, uh, talks to his baby and he, it turns out that he's named his son Henry. And then this wind blow, this is to, to sprinkle a little extra stupid on top. (laughs) The wind blows. We need need a, and when, when this gust of wind cuts through the funeral, Chester gives this little smile and smile and nod, like, 
that's my brother Jiru. Remember when I just declared that every <laughs> wind was my brother a couple of episodes ago? That. Ugh. <laughs> and so to wrap up this whole series, uh, we get a scene where Chester is taking pictures at his uh, his business, which is called H. Nakayama and Son Photography. Mm-hmm. And Osco has a picture of Henry there. Um, and it's it's Chester taking photographs of all the families from the camp. And it turns out that Takei is uh, living in Hawaii now, even though he's back to visit. And he goes, everyone there is Japanese. Yeah. And Luz uh, scolds him about eating too much. And this is... Uh, oh, fuck. Uh, fuck Takei, Takei has been so great in this series. But when yeah. Luz is like, be careful you don't eat too much. And he goes, oh, my. And you're uh, like, no. Fuck this show. Fuck this show. Yeah. Oh, it's so bad. And then Amy Yoshida is like, hey, every time I come back here, I have nightmares because this was horrible. (laughs) (laughs) Remember when we had to go to the internment camp and then nothing but like rape and death and murder happened? Yeah, I killed the man. (laughs) Yeah, I had to kill somebody so that I wasn't raped and murdered. It's like, it's like Kind Command. It's like, yeah, you strangled a man. Yeah, <laughs> I strangled him. I saw that. Hands. You, did, I saw you that. killed a man. <laughs> I, you might want to lay low for a while. And... <laughs> yeah. And so, so everyone just lights some paper lanterns and they set them sailing on these waters, like a, a nice little uh, pond or whatever. And then Chester tells Henry, like, hey, this is why we have Oban, which is this uh, ceremony and he says we have to keep remembering not just the people but the places and what we've seen yeah and then the show does like again this would have been so emotional had the show been better yep but it's like hey here's the actor and here are their ancestors who were in these displacement camps Mm -hmm. and like that for many of the actors were like Takei was in the camp himself or their grandfather was or something like that. And it would have <laughs> meant so much. Yeah. Had I given two shits about this show at this point. Yeah. It was really bad. Like we don't have to discuss it any longer really, but oh, no, 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 no. Like it, it, uh, it was a season that had a lot of promise that at times showed flashes of greatness that ultimately ended in a fizzle and not a satisfying one. Yeah, it was a real, real bummer. Yeah. Um, but Duncan, let's leave the terror infamy behind us. Yeah, because we are getting a season three, by the way. Yeah. That yeah. wasn't well, over Christmas. And I'm like, yeah, why not? As long as they continue doing anthology stuff, they can do whatever they want. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah. So a uh, couple of questions. Uh, a, oh. a, a segment we have discussed uh, before on this show is something that we call uh, Duncan and Bo Get Deep. And yep. and what that is 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 people, um, sometimes strangers, will stop us and ask us uh, some of life's great questions. And we we do our level best to, to you know, uh, there's an old saying, Duncan. Oh. Uh, I'd rather light a candle than curse the darkness. Yes. And, and that yes. is what we, we strive to do. Mm-hmm. So we have two questions this time around. Derek uh, asks us, so if there was any chance for Wilford Brimley, Miles <laughs> Teller, and Tom Waits to have a conversation about evolution, <laughs> what would that sound like to you guys? <laughs> I'm going to just say that I got a feeling that this conversation will be mostly by Bo. <laughs> I think it would go a little something like this. Uh, no, I don't have anything prepared. <laughs> Um, I, I would, <laughs> all right. So I think Brimley would be like, look, <laughs> the only thing that evolved is my understanding of the Holy Bible. God damn it. In the beginning, God created heaven and goddamn earth. And that is it. <laughs> the only thing that's evolved is my diabetes from type one to type two. <laughs> that was my own doing. I took, I took diabetes by the reins and I said, type one diabetes. Fuck you. Give me some corn syrup. 
God damn it. <laughs> so, so I think I think that would be Brimley's take. Yep. Miles Teller would be like, um, <laughs> I guess, uh, I don't know. I heard in biology class that we came from monkeys. Um, can I just ask the keys? I'm taking Sarah to the dance. And, and bring up the rear. Last, last on the list, first in our hearts. I think it would be Tom Waits. He would be like, look. <laughs> there are literally mountains of evidence. It's called the Big Bang. <laughs> Two words, Galapagos Island. <laughs> what are they in what are they evolving in there? <laughs> what are they evolving in there? <laughs> Mr. Krill down the she the street saw a mammal with a duck bill. <laughs> What's he evolving in there? Oh, 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 so good. So good. <laughs> All right. I think that's enough of that. All right. Let's get to <laughs> a real deep question. Oh, great. The, the Ram Man himself mm -hmm. asks us, why have so many in America and Europe turned their backs on science and reason, Duncan? Well, see, this is where I can counter to say that that is actually more a uniquely American thing than it is actually a European thing. Hmm. If you if you look at statistically speaking, um, faith based um, attendance and belief is actually at a remarkable rate. There's less people now that identify. Well, there's more people now that identify as like just generally. Um, you know, non-believers or straight out atheists um, in the UK, Scandinavian countries and specifically down towards, and obviously the closer you get to, to Rome uh, and, and the Vatican, you're going to get a, a peak of them there. But in terms of science, um, I, I would say that you know, Europe is at the, the kind of forefront of that, whether it's uh, renewable energies or, you know, um, the, the, the attitudes towards things like healthcare and stuff like that. There aren't many anti-vaxxers in Europe, if you know what I mean. And there aren't the the proportions of people that have like flat Earth theories and stuff like that are predominantly North American, um, unless our side. I think speaking as a non-American, the reason he on the rise, and I would stress, I don't think it's nearly as prominent as. The internet would have you believe. I mean, there are tiny, tiny, tiny little pockets that have very loud voices that are amplified through the internet. I think it's mostly down to the fact that um, there is so much information out there, whether right or wrong, and people have more freedom to do things that they want nowadays than they ever have. And unfortunately, that breeds stupidity. So. Yeah, I, I think that's I, I think I come down mostly on on that side as well. I, I think you're right. I think that the the amount of misinformation that is oh, tied God, yeah. to a lot of it like it it's tough to know what to believe. And that yeah. is by design. Like there are people who benefit um by confusion and chaos. Of course. So you know, and but why do I think it's happened? Uh I think the root of it is largely economic. Mm -hmm. that uh, especially here in the states because i i'm not i'm not european though i'm often mistaken for european you... due to my sophistication and my liberal attitudes towards sexuality uh, i i i said that the first time we we spoke but... yeah, i know which was uncomfortable but i i dug it <laughs> and <laughs> i was wearing velour pants yeah like I was purple sm smoking purple velour pants Smoking a cigarette in an ivory holder. <laughs> yeah. I had an afro at the time. You did have an afro. It was a mighty fine afro as yeah, well. It was, right. um, it was very similar to one of the uh, the drivers of Speed Buggy, if you remember that cartoon. Oh, God. Uh, uh, an afro similar <laughs> to that. 
Um, yeah, I, I believe that when I saw it for the first time, I remarked that it looked cultivated. Yes, very much so. It was it was a point of pride, and sad to see it go. Um, but <laughs> I but I do think that the the economic roots of it are that as you hear news a lot in this country about how great the stock market is and and how great uh, the economy is doing, but in that same that same time period over the over the past uh you know 10 20 years especially um since the the uh, uh real estate collapse like the the mm-hmm. housing bubble um was really the big bellwether of like oh shit is real fucked up in a way that that could be long term detrimental and i think that there are segments of the economy that recovered from that and and for most people the wages have not gone up commiserate with just general inflation like healthcare, education, uh, just shit in the stores has all gone up at a rate that hasn't really matched pace with wages. Yeah. And, and so when people start to feel pinched and feel like no matter what I do, I can't seem to get ahead. They're looking for someone to blame. Mm-hmm. And the, the, it's it's real easy to point to someone and say this is why things are tough and i i think it's just human nature i think like when when shit is hard and you want you want to believe that it matters that it that that it's what you're doing is worthwhile that all this struggling that you're doing is is useful in some way that it you know that it matters that your life is is meaningful and I think more and more people are starting to feel that that's not the case. And so in a world where your life doesn't like your efforts, your labor, uh, the, the sweat of your brow, where, where that doesn't result in you feeling properly rewarded, um, just by, you know, the American dream, like having a, having a, a car and a house and a wife and a kid and, and being able to afford all that. And it's tough. You know, most people can't afford a house anymore. Uh, mm. You know, that kind of shit. And so when you're in a position like that, like I said, I think it's just real easy to <clears throat> look for a scapegoat. And if someone's telling you, well, the problem is this group of people that's trying to take away, you know, your guns, for example. And I'm not I'm not denigrating people who, who want to keep their hunting rifles and shit like that i'm just saying when when a demagogue perhaps says the problem isn't your wages and the fact that you can't buy a house and the fact that your car needs some work but you really can't afford to do it right now um yeah that's a problem but look at these people who are trying to take this other thing away from you Mm-hmm. And and I think it's real easy at that point to to convince someone who already has this kind of free floating anger. All you're doing is saying, like, take that frustration and point it over here, and yeah. and and let me tell you what to be angry about. And uh, I don't think that's I don't even think that's a wrong impulse. You know, I just think that a lot of the voices telling people what to be angry about are doing so in their own self-interest as opposed to you know you do have populist leaders in in the states who are saying things like hey what we need is a you know an economic or social revolution to change the basic corporate structure of this country uh Mm -hmm. something i tend to agree with but you know um that's also real scary to do so i don't know it's i I think that's where it comes I, i think largely it's economic yeah, I think I, I'm I'm kind of with you to to an extent. I don't think that necessarily. I think the turning against things like like rational science come down to ideas being given the same platform of importance across the board. Like I can create a what would look like a very authentic, very well produced video and post it online on like a YouTube and claim that the earth is flat based on nonsense science that doesn't add up or doesn't tally because I know some buzzwords and people that have not an understanding of science at all can view that and believe that they have learned something. 
and I think that is yeah that that is a real issue and that perpetuates things um over and over and over again like one of my favorite ones about specifically flat earth theory is the ones that are like well standing here i should be able to see that island over there if the you know like i should be able to, if the earth was curved i should this and then you know a scientist will be like and say no that's not right <laughs> like that's right. like literally not what the science proves at all the science proves that you should be able to see that because the curvature is at whatever extent which means you would be able to see x and y and that's that's an issue that someone can just see like terms abstract terms without any sort of um solid background or evidence and just use things as a way to perpetuate all oh, people i think generally like a good conspiracy theory and like to feel that they know something that other people don't believe or that they are it's that elite approach to things i get something that yeah. you just won't get and i think the internet breeds that because there are so many avenues and echo chambers that you can go down where people will just tell you how fucking smart you are um that i think that leads to specifically a turn away from science so when you're talking about things like like the the evidence on anti-vax you know for for kids favors far more in the you know it, you know there are tenuous links to things like autism but the the line that comes at people that are anti-vaxxers is that it causes autism um right and, and the, the the science for that is debunked a million different ways like every yeah. study conducted yeah after that rumor was started has proven it's one yeah. of those things you know it's uh uh, shit, not it's something versus causality. But at any rate, be, because autism presents around the same time uh, that most kids get vaccinated. Yeah, you know it's uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. After it, therefore, because of it. Yeah, and I think as well what what we forget is our understanding of of ailments that people have or people grow up with is just better now you know what i mean yeah. we just know it's like when people are like oh i can't believe that so many people have like like celiac disease or gluten intolerance you know that just seems to be a new spike that's happened no 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 it's been there for a long time it's just all these things used to be called irritable bill syndrome which was an abstract term that was just put as a blanket when you couldn't really quite work out what it was that made you feel all bloated and shit. Um, and <laughs> nowadays, science can actually say, well, no, you have an intolerance to wheat. Right. Or you have an intolerance. You know, like, the, the science is just better at determining that. And as a result, it's like things are spiking more when they're not really, they've been there for a while. Um, so I, I, all these things as well, like, and there's just enough information out there on just enough things to make everyone a pain in the dick. Um, yeah. And that's 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 the problem. It's like the internet is the greatest thing that's ever been invented. And it allows people like myself and yourself who, like in any other walk of life, may never have an opportunity to sit down, record and chat about shared like love interests and and mediums that we, we find really interesting or or just like answer questions from people that live in different parts of the world. The internet is great that it allows us to do that and have information on tap that you know I can't remember what the capital of Uruguay is. Oh click 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 then it's there. Um you know it's it's great for it does have a dark side as well and I'm not talking about the, the dark web here. I'm just talking about the fact that everything is given baseline legitimacy the minute it's posted. Um, everything is by default considered factual when posted and it is you as the person reading it, it's your job to vet things where in the past that's maybe not how information was consumed and or maybe not on the scale that it is and as a result of that I think people become innately tribal with their opinions mm -hmm. and that that expands out beyond political but it also expands into how we feel uh, um, immigration, science, religion, um, sexuality, and, you know, like, and it goes down into the silliest minutiae now um, of of things that are just so mundane. You know, whether or not the, the the you know the local play park should 
have a swing, you know, that doesn't have a certain clearance of it. You don't need these things where, and 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 they're all given like a, a level of importance that I don't necessarily think they all deserve. And I think as a result of that, it, but I'll just say as bad as it, I said this last time as well, as bad as it seems just now, I think it's always been bad. <laughs> like, yeah, like, I think yeah. It's always been bad. I think it's just, we live in a, a situation now where everything is amplified. Like the smallest thing becomes major news um, and that's not fair. And as a result, cycles are so small because of that that things that are really important are forgotten two days after they happen yeah. so and uh, one of the problems that we have here in the states is that we we have the unfortunate problem of having a a president who loves being in the news oh yeah and and so you get a lot of that shit because you know the like say what you will about Donald Trump, uh, support him or not, it's hard to argue that he has busied himself with the job of being president. Yep. And it's more just like, oh, he's just doing the shit that makes sense to him, is pleasing the people that he cares about, blah blah blah. But doing it in as public a way as possible. Look no further than the speech he gave about uh, the the acquittal. That was this crazy slam poetry psychotic event that i recommend to everyone to see how a speech should not be structured yeah it's it's something else but yeah i mean it's that kind of shit where you know yes you're you're absolutely right that that everything seems kind of tweaked but i think part of that problem too is that you know i you know i think boris johnson's kind of cut from the same cloth of like yeah if there's a social issue that he feels like he could benefit by giving a megaphone to. Oh yeah. Then that's what'll happen. But that's how you get power. You know what I mean? That's like, and like yeah. all, all the things, all the things that will get you popular and gain you support and power are megaphones to issues that have a rooted core base that want to, they want to, they want to hear someone say, what they believe as outrageous as it might seem at times like they want to hear it and as soon as someone you can as soon as you can tap into that um you you will like by proxy just get a huge amount of support whether that is in the states all you have to do is say you believe in god and boom you you know you, you get the, the gracious goodwill of a huge section of your society regardless what what else you're doing as soon as you lean into that you have that um, in the UK, Boris Johnson smartly, um, because I think he's not given credit for how clever he actually is. He's like that. He's he plays an idiot, but he's a very, very, very shrewd, very smart person. Who, yeah, like that's the, the problem. I think people like I don't appreciate how how savvy and smart he actually is. And as a result, you can see things like wiffle waffle, and people are like, oh, "Listen, to this fucking idiot." Um, but he 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 set out with an agenda, and that agenda has put him essentially in power for the next five years in the UK unattested. Yeah. With, with his opposition, his opposition destroyed. Like in 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 the in the parliament, they're um, both the main parties. If you remove the SNP, because you have to remove them because they're Scotland only party. The two national parties there are both currently seeking new leadership so he, he not only swept through with a majority but he took out the two leaders of the two opposition parties so i mean <laughs> i don't like the guy i think he's like absolutely fucking horrendous and opportunistic in that he didn't believe in anything that he said up until he saw public support go that way and then leaned hard into it. And he's, you know, from that point of view, he's dangerous because he has no real morals that way. He has no real beliefs. He's a, he's a husk that is just filled with whatever will get him to the position of power that he wants to be in. That being said, though, he played, like most of the people on that side, played the UK like a fiddle and spent years. But my favourite thing about it is that they are still mourning 
about all the injustice and all the bad things to do with austerity and all the rest, and his party had been in power for 10 years. 10 years. Right. Like, they have been in since the economic crash, and they are still complaining about how hard up people are, how, you know, how bad the NHS is and all the rest. They have been in charge of it for 10 years. That's that's like me driving, Bo, and you in the car with me, and me crashing the car and blaming you for crashing the car. That is that is what that that is the level, and people, for whatever reason, are just not grasping it. I don't understand that they very very carefully and very smartly deflected everything to immigrants from the EU. Everything is immigrants, yeah. and most of what the problems are in the UK are not controlled by Europe. Well, we're never controlled by Europe. They were controlled by the UK. And statistically, all the evidence proved that it was nonsense. But, you know, they took our jobs. They took our jobs. I, I got to tell you. literally all you need to do. And you have a swath of, of people that are genuinely aggrieved. They voted for the Conservative Party in, like, in, in droves. They voted for the Conservative Party the party that put so many mining towns and industrial towns out of fucking business, they voted for that party because they said it was immigrants that caused those those places to shut down in the 70s, 80s and 90s and not the Tory policies. That to me is, that is the, that is, that is what will be dissected and debated and ultimately looked back with this great air of shame 20, 30 years from now. Like, why is our country fucked? Well, I'll tell you why it is, because they <laughs> managed to dupe a lot of stupid people. No, that's not fair. That's not, and I, I I, don't like it when that's said. It's not stupid people, it's desperate people. They managed to dupe a lot of desperate people mm. who desperately wanted some sort of change to something uh, and, and some sort of outlet to blame the circumstances that they were setting, very similar to what you mentioned earlier on, and all you have to do is put a face in it. Or a name to it and ride into that hard and you get you, you get the desired outcome. The only problem with that desired outcome and that huge majority that they have um is that they now have to make good on everything they said to get into power and they no longer have the well it's it was Europe, wasn't it? It was Europe, it's Europe's fault. And he set himself he said that this is and damn near Trump-like words in the way he said it, he's going to get the greatest deal, the best deal with Europe, and it's going to be done by the end of this year. And Europe have told him, and everyone else, and economists and all the rest have told him, it can't fucking, it won't happen. It's too complicated. Like, we were so entangled with things. It will not be done in 11 months, but he says he'll do it. And I think as soon as that is realised that, He's not, that's when I think people will start to go, hmm, do we think we made a mistake? I mean, they partied. I saw I saw videos of people partying mm. and Big Ben Big Ben didn't didn't chime at the half a million pound it was gonna cost each chime. And they were considering on doing it as well until someone said, That's a waste of money, isn't it? <laughs> that seems expensive, yes. yes. That seems quite expensive. So, you know, it never happened, but there was plenty of parties out there and there's tons of video evidence because you'll always get the, and I can say it this time, you'll always get the dumb people to speak on TV. It's like, you'll always manage to get that one that say, yeah, well, you know, well, we've taken back all our laws. It's not how that worked. Yeah. <laughs> like, like there's, there's an insidious plan like in place to get us out of the European uh, Human Convention rights. They've already seceded, I think, as part of their bargaining uh, territorial shipping um, and fishing lanes, which will, you know, greatly affect Scotland. And they will do absolutely anything to stay in power. And uh, a guy who I don't genuinely agree with a lot, um, but I, I heard an, a really interesting interview with him a couple of days ago, uh, Peter Hitchens, who is the brother of the late Christopher Hitchens, um, who, if you've never looked at Chris Vetches, I didn't always really uh, like see eye tie with his opinions, but a fascinating speaker and had a very strong opinion specifically on religion uh, and on Clinton. His Clinton rants are amazing. Um, but Peter Hitchens has been on this Britain 
been fucked for a while. So like, he uses better words. Um, and he basically said the uh, the voters condemned their country to prolong the Conservative Party instead of allowing the Conservative Party to die to prolong their country. Yeah, And that's exactly what happened. I yeah. couldn't have said it any better. I, I, I mean, I think uh, the U.S. is in the same place. I mean, you, you have a, a... You have a... You have a real danger, by the way, of another another Trump term. I'm just giving you... I'm just letting you know that right absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. no. You are, you are 100% right. He is, he is going to be very difficult to beat, not just because he's an incumbent president, not just because he has this incredible hold over his base. Yep. Um, but also because... Uh, there was an Onion article that I thought was quite funny that somebody found that um, from a few years ago that was like <laughs> Democrats find way to lose primary. Yeah, um, <laughs> and that's kind of what happened. It's just like, man, you, you guys, you fucking idiots. You got, yep. you got the one thing you can't do in this scenario is fuck up the nomination. It doesn't matter who it is. Yeah, you just got to get somebody there clean. Yeah, you've and got to be a, you've got to be above and beyond approach after spending the last three years talking about election rigging. Yeah, you, right. Like you, you right. can't, you cannot fuck that up. Yeah. You cannot fuck that up, and uh -huh. you have fucked that up, and you have gifted, you've gifted him a talking point that he will lean into a lot. But I think I, 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 the sad thing is, the, the sad thing is, like. I, I genuinely don't see anyone in that field taking down Trump, regardless what your yeah. opinion polls no, no, say. No, no, I don't I'm see any of them. And I'd like as much as like, I, I mean, I'm I don't have to worry about it. It's not it's, it's not my election, and you know, I, I don't like I've said it before. Even your most left leaning, <laughs> even your Bernie Sanders, who's considered your most left leaning social kind of Democrat. Um, it's still not left for it's still not left yeah. enough for for right. what vo what is voted in in Scotland. Like in Scotland, it's you know it is left of centre. You're left of centre, still technically right of centre. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's it's weird. It's weird. Really, like you know, like he's a socialist. Well, he's he's not really. Um, but the like like that, I don't have to worry about that. But if people think that like Bernie Sanders getting the nomination and going up against Trump is going to is going to get him in the White House. They're not right. Um, yeah, no. Like, Bernie Sanders has a lot of big problems. Uh, yep. Getting elected, especially in the the middle states, like the rest oh, of yes. the states and shit. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to do fine on the East Coast. He's going to do fine on the West Coast. It's the middle that that plagues Democrats. Yeah, and... he needs to win decisively the places that Clinton didn't. Right, um, right. And I just don't see evidence there that that's going to happen. Yeah, and, the, and some of the polling suggests that he, he's not doing great there. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I, there, there's, I, I think the, the X factor in all of this is going to be that segment of the population that's like, I don't care who the fuck it is, as long yeah. as it's not Trump, because I'm sick and tired of hearing about it. Yeah. So I think there's, like, you've got a weird built-in advantage of people who just don't want to hear about Trump anymore. And yeah. I think that's got to be one of the best messages in the general, is like, hey, you want to go back to your life and just not worry about this shit anymore? Elect me. You're yeah. not. You're not going to hear from me. You need to get those people out, though. You need to get those people out and voting, and I think you, that's like that. There's big. That's it's, that's it's a similar problem over here. People. Scotland, weirdly yeah. enough, has like our our, um, our election turnouts have been since the referendum surprisingly high. It's like it's usually it's a, it's like seventy percent uh, turnout um, nationally, which I think is like a. a considering what it was in the 90s is surprisingly high in Scotland but it's not in England <laughs> like, it's, it's been going down for quite some time um, and will continue uh, to, to go down because uh, you I'm just getting people motivated to do things and understand that these like whoever is in that office has a real world effect on you for however long they are in power and um, 
I just don't think I don't think that message resonates with young kids uh, or young people. Sorry, at all. Yeah, it, it's hard to convince them. Like, hey, th- this is the Bernie Sanders problem: is convincing a lot of his fervent supporters who are just ride or die for Bernie Sanders to be mm-hmm. like, hey, you knuckleheads. Even if Bernie Sanders isn't the nominee, you still need to vote for whoever that is. Yeah. You know, like, just be like, oh, man, they screwed Bernie again. It's like, look, he's a 78-year-old socialist in a country that, as you pointed out, is scared of the word. Yes, yeah, so, but I don't think you'll ever see, uh, and anyone that thinks you will see a quote unquote socialist, um, you know, they like, won't be labeled like, that. No, God, no, they can't because yeah. you're, you you did such a good job of of making the word socialist sound like communist, <laughs> like, like a, <laughs> right? It, ignoring the fact that we this country has a number of significant social programs that you could never touch for yeah. fear of the the population rising up against you but they yeah. don't understand that that's socialism yeah so. the, the, the 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 pure fact that the trade war resulted in trump giving out billions of dollars Take aid to farmers is the very definition of socialism. hundred <laughs> percent. Yes. It's the this very is... de- and these are the people that voted for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so all right. Look, uh, we we will continue to get deep. Please uh, send your questions to Bo at legionpodcasts dot com. Subject line: Get deep. Um, deep. Also, if you follow Legion Podcasts on the Facebook. Um, you will get uh, a notice there as well. So um, let us move over to the uh, the films of the evening. Yes. And we're just going to do a little back and forth here to wrap things up and talk about some movies uh, that we've been watching or movies that uh, the other person has caught up to. And uh, let, we, we mentioned Dr. Sleep earlier. Let me, let me get this out of the way. Uh, so I saw Bliss. Ah. And uh, I did not enjoy Bliss. Um, that does not surprise me. <laughs> I I found that, uh, I, first of all, to say that it, it's like, well, it's reminiscent of, uh, you know, addiction. It's like, mm, all right. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it is. It, I, I, think it, it, I think it's... It's uh, very similar in much the same way yeah. that like Joe Bagos seems to be inspired by other projects and is like, well, I'll do my riff on it. Um, yeah. but I think with bliss, my biggest problem with bliss is that I think the main character is terrible and I hated. You, you're the, you're, uh, you're the Andy Blockley it. approach to this. Andy Blockley hated her. Um, and as a result, he the movie. <laughs> so, I, yeah. I, it just, it was that off putting, like, I don't mind an unlikable protagonist uh-huh. to some degree, but I just, I don't think the performance is very good. And I don't think the character is likable. And it may be that the character is unlikable because I don't think the performance is good, but like every scene that, <laughs> that the main character is in i wanted it to stop yeah so yeah oh dear it's... <laughs> no, I, I love that to me it's um like i said i think when we spoke about it maybe on the episode that got lost to me bliss is this weird hybrid of something like addiction meets uh, abel ferrara's thriller killer it's like a weird kind of clone of the two movies almost as if they went in the the, the kind of Brundle fly machine, um, and, and came out, and I, I apps, I, I think it's, I think it's brilliant. But... I, I do think this is a, a situation where, like, Joe Bagos is the anti Robert Eggers for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Where it's like I, I know that there is that frequency that would make this movie good. Mm. And I just don't vibrate at that frequency like that. I just, I've yet to find a, a Vegas film. Um, and I, like, I'm not shitting on the guy. Like I don't, I don't, I'm not telling fans of his work that they're wrong. I just haven't seen one that I thought was a winner. Mm. Um, but you know, I mean, he could get there. Like I, again, I still don't feel like I've seen, and I, I've said this to you a number of times about Joe Vegas. 
Um, I still don't feel like I've seen a Joe Bagos movie. I still uh, feel but, like Bliss mm-hmm. is too, like you said, it's this this blend of uh, like Abel Ferrara, um, a sort of Manhattan realism married to the more bolder cinematic look to it. Yeah, and but I still don't think that's a Joe Bagos movie. Or maybe oh, it is. I don't know. New one might be the one to sway you. Then I've got to see it at Glasgow Fright Fest. So that's that BFW one, yeah, okay. which um, is about um, uh, veterans who are at their local. Is it VFW, VWF, v- VFW, the, Veterans of Foreign yeah. Wars. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're at one of these establishments, and um, mutated punks try and trying to think um try and take it over and they have to stand and fight and it's got what's his face from a uh, karate kid uh michael and uh, no, michael thingy michael the, the, thingy the did that's the leader of cobra kai oh yeah 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 okay uh i know i i don't know the actor's name but i know you're talking about yeah, See, yeah that so sounds like, like assault on precinct 13 though yeah, but I'm fine with that. <laughs> like, but again, that's not all right. Again, yeah. Wait, wait, like, but the weird thing is, as much as I'm I'm saying all this shit about Joe Bagos, I will still watch that movie because I'm like, that sounds cool. Yeah, I want that to be great. Yeah, Maybe I, do, I, I think. Yeah, I think the thing is though, like, I don't mind people riffing on things as long as this. The uh, I don't mind people riffing on things if what well, I don't want to be sitting. Th- said about like the end of Doctor Sleep is when I'm watching scenes recreated from The Shining I'm thinking about The Shining I, like when I was watching Bliss I wasn't thinking you know this is the addiction or this is it has a tone and an ear about it and it maybe follows certain beats but it's not like it's not the same movie you know what I mean it's, yeah. it's like when you watch the, when I, me and you both agreed when we watched The Void like I was watching the void going, well, this is obviously Escape from New York. You know, sorry, Assault on Precinct Thirteen, and and you know, like and to the point that even when the synth score kicked in, I was like, oh, here we go, here's the Carpenter synth score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like and then it became Hellraiser at the end, and it went all Hellraiser, just exactly like Hellraiser. Um, like there's, I think there's a difference between like. There's a difference between an imagine and just out and out like I'm just stealing ideas, and I think. Joe Bigos, for the most part, my opinion is he's very good at homaging stuff that's interesting him, like real influences. Um, I don't think he copies them. I, I, I've heard exactly plenty of people tell me. I've heard plenty of people tell me though, like, yeah, but this is his Cronenberg movie. This is John Carpenter movie, and it's difficult for me to argue against that. All I know is when I watch them, I am not pining for a John Carpenter movie or for a Cronenberg movie. I'm in that movie until it finishes. And then at the end, I'm like, yeah, I can see where his influence for this comes from and that comes from. So I think, like, Joe B goes to me is just the director that, you know, makes the movies he just wants to make. And mm-hmm. if they bear a, a resemblance to other movies, then they bear a resemblance and you're either with it or you're not. But um, I'm interested to see what his new one like, because he basically made Bliss and this other one back to back. Um, so I hadn't made anything for a couple of years and then made two movies back to back and his, I'm like well that's cool with me <laughs> his new so. one Duke of Sunset yeah <laughs> where <laughs> the, the devil is found in a I don't know a coke can <laughs> that's way behind him yeah. it's way behind him <laughs> to be, to be fair. Uh, so tell yes. me something you've been watching I don't, I don't, I don't want to well, again I think it says something that as, as as much shit as I've given him, I'm still going to watch the next Joe Bigos movie. So yeah, but I think I think he's the thing is like from your like you've never out and out said well fuck this guy. I think that's no. the thing. I think you you you're interested to see what the next project is. Where I know for a fact there are certain like see if I said to you Eli Ross got a movie coming out next year. Yeah, I don't think there's yourself. much chance. Yeah, either one of us are going to rush to go and. See one you know what i mean whereas yeah, yeah, if yeah. joe bigos has a movie coming out this year i will check that out because i'm, I'm in, very much like yourself i'm interested to see what that project will look like he's he's so, too busy doing the you know eli ross paycheck of horror show for yeah AMC. which i'm i'm fine with that yeah, i like you want to be a horror the, the fan dude, fine just don't make yes yeah, yeah he's, he's the thing is he knows he's shit like he he knows his, he's the he, that he gets dubbed as that the Tarantino of horror for a good reason. He's, he does have an encyclopedic knowledge of that. And that to me is where I think he's 
I think his interview still is really good as well. Like, so I'd like, I'm like, like you, I am happy to see him just keep doing that. You know what I mean? They're like, if he keeps away, and if he wants to put his name to get projects done, you know, like that clown movie where he basically, the, you know, the guys were like, we're going to make a fake trailer about this idea, and we're going to put Eli's Ross's name on it, and he was like, that, right, I'll get you the money, go make it. And like, if he wants to use his name as a, a clout to allow other filmmakers to make stuff, I'm fine with that as well. Sure. Um, I just don't think, as a director, he has much left to say. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the it's the Rob Zombie problem. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hundred. Hundred percent. Tell me. Tell me what else you've been watching, though. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Um. So without going into the kind of heavier hitters, we'll, we'll skim around the bottom. Uh. I went to see that. I went to see that movie, The Turning. Oof. Oh, I stayed away. I that seemed Oof. bad. Oh. The thing is, it's not. The first two thirds of that movie are well shot. Mm-hmm. Um, well acted mm -hmm. and suitably haunting in parts that it never really goes too ostentatious but it delivers what you expect from a kind of modern kind of telling of a gothic ghost story and it handles all that really well and then you get into the last third of that movie and it has studio involvement ripping all the way through it so much so that the movie actually doesn't have an ending oh wow which I'm not even just like I know what you're thinking. You're you know, what do you mean? Get, I, I mean that the movie doesn't have an ending. <laughs> like, the movie really? you think, yeah, you think the movie has an ending, and then it pulls back from that ending, uh, kind of giving you the it gives you the most pedestrian of endings, and then what it does is it does a kind of ah, you thought that happened, well, it actually never happened, and you get a bit of dialogue which you think is going to lead to something, and then credits roll. And then you're like, well, no, you've not answered any questions. Does, you've not, there does, is no. <laughs> does any portion of this turn out to be a dream? So the the reveal of what you think is a pedestrian ending is a hallucination that she has. And then she wakes up back in place, almost like she's envisaged this is going to happen. The 47 meters down trick. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the descent, right? You know, it is yeah. the, the descent thing with that. But in the descent, you know, the camera pulls back and you see the creatures coming for her. Or like in 47 meters down, she wakes up and there's sharks fucking there. Like in the case of this one, she like kind of comes to and she's like, oh, oh, like that. And then she goes and has these, this conversation with these kids who, um, who then make a comment about how broken she is. <laughs> like uh, as a character you just like this broken just like this broken doll D and then they does it in with them being like lady you so crazy it's not far off it is like really like she she goes to take the doll off the girl and the doll falls to the ground and cracks this is a spoiler for a movie that you know I would still say you need to see the ending to, to, to try and work out how a movie like this made its way into cinema. Um, All right. And how, how Spielberg's name was once attached to it. That's the bit that blew Man, my mind. Boy, they were real hush-hush about that in the in the oh, promotion of the movie. He was, he was behind it right until um, the rewrite and then a little bit of the reshooting. But he was involved, even up to the point of it actually beginning filming, he was on board as a, a producer and whatnot. And then that disappeared real fucking fast i was buried fucking fast um you know you know what i mean it got taken away just as quick as a brother film you know yeah. like we're getting that one in a fucking <laughs> we're editing the shit at this um but when she drops this doll the doll cracks um finn wolf hard walks past and says uh, looks like you're as cracked as you know, you're, like you're as broken as this doll and then they walk and i'm like right but we still have a fucking spiritual entity of this malevolent stable hand that's haunting the house um you know a, a family that's in danger uh you know like potential possessions sexual abuse all these things are still on the line and then the movies like that credits Ugh. all right that sounds... <laughs> like like no not credits uh, and then i stuck around for an after credit scene just in case Samuel L. Jackson was going to come out and recruit the Avengers. You I'm know, putting like... together something called the Henry James Initiative. <laughs> the Henry James-averse. 
And then, well, well, no, no, you get none of that. And, it's and, the and, turning of the screw and then Tropic of Cancer. These kids are going to start <laughs> fucking in the next movie. It's just, it was so, so abrupt. And it clearly is, it's clearly in the rewrites. I, I think it went through dramatic rewrites before it, it came out and reshoots and whatnot. And they pieced it together. They've obviously got to a point where they're like, that. this is the best that we can do. Let's just do it in January um, when it will make money. Uh, probably yeah. take a loss, but it'll, I think it. I think it did make money, uh, th- but I think the 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 margins are so slim um, that yeah, it's, it's, it's just a. Uh, and the sad thing about it is that, it, like I say, it's well shot and it's well acted, and even some of the the, the kind of visual cues for the the haunting aspect of it are done really, really, really well. Uh, it just. It gets to a point where it's like that. If we go down this road, this movie's not going to have an ending. And it's like, we need to go down this road. And once you're trapped in that, you're like, I would much rather see if you chopped the last five minutes off and just gave me the very banal pedestrian ending. At, at least it would have been something. Uh, but instead, they try and be clever and abstract with it by giving you nothing. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, good times, right. yeah, Bo. Good sounds, times. That sounds like a movie I would watch, Duncan. Hey, I'll tell you uh, a movie that is uh, not worth your time at all. No. Uh, that on. last Rambo movie. Rambo Last oh, yeah. Blood. Yeah, I saw it in the cinema. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so, it's a movie that hates itself and hates its audience. Yeah, man. Like, look, I don't, I don't claim that the last rambo film was high art but it was <laughs> sure as fuck fun mm-hmm. and like when he turns that machine gun around <laughs> on a dude sitting in the front seat of that jeep and turns him into hamburger meat yeah that is fucking awesome when he appears from the trees behind someone and rips out a man's trachea with his bare hands Something kind of metal about that book. Yeah, well, yeah, right. And that's all I wanted out of this movie. And instead, it's like this character who has perpetually been a loner yep. is all of a sudden a family guy on a farm. And you're like, wait, what the fuck? When did he come <laughs> back from Laos? Explain that to me. Enough that he has a relationship, like a deep relationship with this young girl. Yeah, he's also teaching her how to ride a horse, so... Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, if you need me to look over your math homework or something. <laughs> no, I'm pretty good at calculating. Um, yeah. And so, and, and he's also like, <laughs> hey, also, I built a home alone set of tunnels under your house. I hope that's oh, okay. Oh, God, yeah. Dude. I just think, just kept expecting him to bump into Jason Voorhees. Or, no <laughs> shit, or like drop a paint can on one of these guys' heads. Like, it is, but, but it is so grim and unrelentingly bleak. Yeah. And then at the end of the movie, they do that montage that's like, here is a real American. Yeah, and yeah. Like, <laughs> this montage of him like riding horses and shit. That movie is utter fucking nonsense. Yep. Yep. Oh, well, my finished, God. and I had a headache. <laughs> like you said, this movie hates itself. It is so. Oh, it hates itself. So it hates itself. It hates its characters. Um, it it it's, it just low. It, it's, a loathing seeping out of every single orifice in this movie and yeah. then it has the audacity to show you clips of better movies at the end <laughs> yeah I, like even when they show rambo 3 i was like yeah that was probably better than this yeah that's that's how like, i don't know if you you know this Bob, but that's how you in hindsight make things look better is by making something worse <laughs> or electing someone worse <laughs> so <laughs> yeah it, oh my god man it it was awful, mm-hmm. but okay. So g- give me another one from you that maybe isn't so bad as Rambo Last <laughs> Blick. Uh, I'll give you one which That's the is bad magazine title Rambo <laughs> Last Blick. Hey, I saw that Richard Jewell movie that you uh, Clint Eastwood. Oh yeah, affair. yeah. Which is the like, which is a movie that has a really interesting, compelling story told by. Uh, an old man who has went to the dark side of right-wing media hatred. Um, oh, wow. 
Oh, really, really to the point where every agent of the FBI is like a caricature and completely bumbling. The press sleep with their sources to, to get answers, which that's where the big controversy about this is. Um, come at the moment is the portrayal of the main journalist in the story. Uh, she sleeps with the FBI agent to get the information and everyone is like, that did not happen. Like even even right. the actress who plays her says, uh, you know, I did my research and all the rest. That didn't actually happen. <laughs> like, right, she wasn't and, actually uh, Mata Hari. <laughs> you're like didn't happen at all, um, and it's just all this. Well, the media's wrong, fake news, um, and the FBI are all evil because conspiracy. And uh, this Richard Jewell guy, the last goddamn patriotic American bull, god damn it. Sure. Um, and there's some really good performances. Sam Rockwell is fucking incredible. It's fucking incredible in it. Uh, the dude that plays um, that Richard Jewell, whose name escapes me, but he's a great actor, fucking incredible in it. But it speaks down to its audience at a level which it's so fucking dumb like so so dumb there's a bit in it that there's no there's no fucking joke right there's a bit in it where someone has called in the bomb threat from a certain distance away from the park where the bomb goes off and sam rockwell takes the case he's going to defend richard joe and really early on he's like that he's like you know walk from where i know richard was seen to this telephone to see if it could be done and there's that bit where he's walking up to the phone and he checks his watch, he's like that. No way he made this call, right? No way he made this call. Um, and then later in the movie, later in the movie, the the reporter, the reporter who, like, she gets a bit of evidence that maybe Richard isn't actually the guy, she makes exactly the same journey filmed for the audience. And she gets up there and she's looking at her watch and she's like, no way he made this call. <laughs> and you're like, oh, fuck off, right? There's a bit as well, like, he's out walking his dog. This is, like, what, 1996? And he died in 2000 of a heart attack. But there's a bit where he's out walking his dog and he starts holding his heart as if he's getting chest pains, which I don't believe Richard Jewell had back in 1996. But it's to let you know that when they do that thing at the end where it says in 2007 he died of a heart attack, you can go, oh, that's right, he held his heart that time, remember? <laughs> you are fucking so fucking dumb. Remember so fucking when dumb. he touched his chest because that's where the heart lives. It's like so fucking dumb. Like, honestly, it is, yeah, for, it is, it is some great performances, like, encased in shit. Like, really dumb, watered down, like, base dumping nonsense and yeah yeah <laughs> let's wrap go. her up or, or start wrapping her up with some good movies yeah and have I you want... seen that grudge movie yet though no <laughs> look man like, if, if you're gonna you dump, should check that one out <laughs> if you're gonna dump a horror movie out in january you gotta expect me to watch it sometime in april all <laughs> right <laughs> you play yeah that, that's a movie you should watch no it, right off. it should it should be up my alley but what i heard coming out of that thing was like oh, oh, oh i can i can sleep on this for a little bit um, it's not the, it's not as bad as the internet told you it was good um, good because it's, it's not very good either i'll tell right. you this way i'll tell you this way if nicholas pesh who i think is a great fucking director mm -hmm. at least gives you an american grudge movie gives you an american geo movie Okay. Um, and that it is narratively the time jump. You know what I mean? It's like several stories that all intersect. And he does that really, really well. It's just none of those stories are particularly interesting. Uh, <laughs> so, <all right. laughs> but they're, they're all linked. Um, so <laughs> I'll be interested to see what you're... you're it's a grim fucking movie. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, 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 I will see it. Um... But what uh, I did see, Duncan, that I know you uh -huh. saw and loved, yes, is a little movie called In Fabric. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to. I, I know where it landed in your end of year list, um, and I read some of your comments. Yet I have not spoken to you about it yet. 
Uh, I get the feeling that I enjoyed it more than you. I think you did, and but I didn't not enjoy it, uh, mm. as many scientists have have said. Um, <laughs> I think it is half one of the best movies I've ever seen, <laughs> and half a movie that never really engaged me. Uh, all right. And and so all the stuff in and around the department store is some of the best shit that ever was. Yeah, it's fucking incredible. It, <laughs> undeniably. The advertisement for the store is one of the best things I've ever seen in a movie. Mm -hmm. And the sort of loquacious manner... Oh, the way um, she speaks is absolutely the test. It's it's so good. Everybody in the in, in the place and the, yep. this idea of this like not since Dawn of the Dead have I enjoyed a satire of consumerism in a horror movie more. Mm -hmm. um, that said, the when it gets into the stories of the lives of the characters that the dress is affecting, I kind of. It, it feels a little too meandering for my taste. All right. And it's not terrible. I just never felt like I was really into it. And so at any rate, yeah, that was a bit of a bummer. Um, in, in terms of like, there's there, like I said, there's part of this movie that is one of my favorite <laughs> movies I've ever seen. And then it, I feel like it gets dragged down by the point it gets narrative, but I know you need the narrative part of it. I, ju I just didn't connect with it the way I did something like, you know, even the Duke of Burgundy, I found to be a, a more relatable movie in a weird way, mm. uh, as opposed to in fabric, which seemed more like an artistic exercise that didn't didn't move me emotionally the way that that burgundy did but um but it's beautiful it is absurd and wonderful and i you know i i don't it, it, for me it's imperfect and that's what's frustrating about it because all the stuff uh as i said in and around the the department store itself is i mean it's it's so fucking good yeah you know like <laughs> jaw dropping like coen brothers good yeah and and that's what it reminded me of most. And again, it's because of the the wordplay that's being used in the scene. But it's like, oh, this is like, you know, as we've talked before, if the Coen Brothers did a horror movie, it's like, oh yeah, this this almost feels like Barton Fink taken a step further. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, but I know you loved it, so please uh, tell me why I'm wrong. I, I don't necessarily think you're wrong. I think there is uh, the three stories themselves. The, well, the three kind of uh, stories that are based on people that uh, buy the drug comes into their procession, I think are there's something inherently British about them um, in terms of the way they, they kind of it's, it's a movie that's incredibly insular in terms of it's a like it's bit there's a, a a kind of very mundane sort of situational horror between you know a woman who's coming out of a relationship and just trying to you know put this dress on and like get back out and get dating um down to the you know the washing machine repair man you know like there's, there's a very kind of mundane situational sort of horror that i just found really, it reminded me that i saw as a kid like like, like there was a lot of these kind of i mentioned it quite a lot but things like uh roald dahl's tales of the unexpected and things there's a uh, these like small anthology TV shows that would have these just little small kind of vignettes you would watch of and case stories that were just weird and um, it, it has all that. I thought the performances were like across the board and all the stories were incredible. Um, the score, oh my oh, god, sure. oh the score is like hypnotic and mind blowing and. Um, yeah, like I, I, I was told, I saw this at a small independent cinema in Edinburgh on the one day it was shown theatrically, <laughs> like, and uh, uh, close to, to where I lived. Um, and I, you know, I had I had to go and see it. I took the day of work to go and see it because I was like, I'm going to go and see this in the cinema, and sat down in the cinema with about three people in it, and was just 
like I have felt myself absorbing it in the chair watching it. I thought it was absolutely incredible. It's maybe maybe one of the most beautiful movies of last year. It's mm -hmm. maybe one of the most unique movies uh, in terms of like horror. Yeah, I think that and it it owes like everything that I love about Peter Strickland. It owes to you know seventies Euro horror. There's hints to there's little snippets of Jallo in there. There's little snippets of the kind of Euro erotic stuff in there as well. And I don't think it's his best movie. I still think to me, I I think it's still like I kind of toss up between um, Duke of Burgundy, which I do think is like maybe as close to a masterpiece of that sort of style of cinema there's ever been. Um, and Bavarian Sim Studio, which I think is, once again, maybe one of the most unique movies I've ever seen. Um, but I think it's it combines lots of different things. It's very daring. It, you know, it's a movie that really like challenges to be different. And whilst it doesn't all completely work at the end, and I've seen it twice now, and the second viewing, I appreciated more of the craft that went behind it, whereas the first viewing, I was appreciating more of the story. So he's an incredible filmmaker, like a genuinely like one of these guys now that whatever Strickland puts his name against, I I, I cannot fucking wait to see it because I, I think he's, he's him and there's, there's a kind of, a little croft of, of British filmmakers that are just really exciting that are doing this stuff which is you know nods to to kind of 70s uh, styles of cinema and Wheatley's one of them and Strickland's the other and the fact that they're friends and the fact that Wheatley kind of helps produce and fund Strickland's work it just makes me like so fucking happy. Um, yeah, I, I, I genuinely, I, I genuinely, like it was what it is of all the movies I saw last year, it is the most unique horror movie. And yeah, uh, it, it's just, yeah. there's like, there's just one that came out last year that was even remotely in the similar ballpark. Um, and there are movies that have like, like Luz, for example, is set roughly in the same time period. And has, you know, a very kind of like German kind of late 70s, early 80s sort of vibe going on with it. And they feel like they could exist in the same world. Um, but Strickland's just looks so polished. It looks, it looks like he spent all the money on that movie. Uh, and it didn't cost that much, which is the thing that blows my mind. He like, seems to work within modest budgets and deliver things that feel like they demand to be seen on a big screen. Yeah, so. he's he's got a gorgeous eye, no doubt about it. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what what else you got there, Duncan? Um, let me swing in with a movie which, had I seen it last year, would have been my favorite movie of the year. Okay, like hands down. And this is going to be controversial because it's not the one that I think you think I might say. Um, but it's not a horror movie either. Even though I hear some people talk about horror movies, uh, there's a conversation about horror which is adjacent to this one but I saw Parasite and Parasite to me is the best movie of 2019 I think it is like across the board hands down flawless absolutely 100% immaculate flawless funny dark twisted um, playful and just inc like fucking incredible like I, I, the movie finished, like we saw it, it, it finally made it's finally made its way to the UK. So um, me and my wife went to see it, and I was surprised that my wife wanted to go and see it. In fact, like before we walked in, I was like, "You are aware this is in Korean?" <laughs> Just like <laughs> she's like, "Yeah, like, yeah." She's like, "That means like subtitles," and I was like, "Yep, yep, that means subtitles, lots of subtitles." And then we sat in and we watched it, and. Um, like I got to the end and like my wife doesn't listen to these so we're fine um I got to the end and we'd driven in separate cars because she comes straight from work I come straight from work and uh, we go back in the house and I was just like oh oh the movie <laughs> this movie is fucking amazing uh hallelujah uh, and um she's like yeah it was it was all right she was like I really enjoyed it right up until the very end and I was like 
how to do this without sounding like a man mansplaining here. I was like, you didn't get it, didn't you? And she's like, of course I fucking got it. And then she proceeded to tell me her read of the end of the movie, to which I very quickly realised she didn't get. Um, right. so, like, so I, I explained my read of the end of the movie, uh, to which she was like, that that's really clever. And I was like, now you know why I was like, oh, this movie... Just, just fucking amazing. Like, at, once again, like, that part of the world, like, it, like it, as long as he and... a uh, Mark Yeah, yeah. They alternate, like, one movie every two years um, each, like, for the end of time. I'm guaranteed an incredible movie every two years. Right. Like, honestly, like, right. it, yeah, just, like, because if memory serves, The Handmaiden was two years ago. Um... And, that's right. Was that twenty? Yeah, and I, I think the year before that was Okja, which was fucking amazing. Um, and then the year before that was Stoker, and then the year before that was Snowpiercer. Uh, right? Snowpiercer. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, just keep, just keep doing what you're doing, guys. Maybe is all I'm saying. <laughs> maybe Park Chan Wook is actually in Bong Joon Ho's cellar, <laughs> and is kept there. <laughs> To write a movie, oh, and when, dude, he, when, when he comes up with a good enough one, it's like, okay, now you're you can go out and make one. Wait, see, see when he, see when they're talking about the kid having trauma experiences, and then the flashback to the set of eyes appearing. You've seen the movie, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Eyes, like no argument like, here. Yeah, it's the incredible. set of eyes appearing above the the stairs. Yeah. of the guy, for, uh, like that is one of those scenes where I'm like. Part of me is laughing at how ridiculous this is. The other part of me is fucking terrified because if I saw a child, I would be ruined. <laughs> sure. Just the most fucking terrified show ever. Yeah, you would um, shit yourself and immediately call a therapist. Yeah, just so fucking great. And I've just um, recorded uh, on, for Podcast Under the Stairs, just recorded an episode, which will be out by the time this is out, on we're covering over three episodes the vengeance trilogy and like mm. watching the vengeance trilogy and seeing that they would pair up like the sympathy for mr vengeance and um a parasite would would double bill really fucking well actually really mm. really well but also the the dad of the poor family in parasite is the father of the abducted girl who's the wealthy guy in the sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. Right. So it's like, it's an inverse of situations. Yeah. Um, and it also a, a, an inverse of, of, of endings as well. But what I didn't realize until watching Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, because I, I, I did clock that, was the woman that, you've seen Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, yeah? I mean, it's been probably close to a decade. Yeah, revisit. I'm telling I'm you sure, now that movie course. is fucking amazing yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but like our, our main our main antagonist protagonist whatever we want to call him uh, gets his kidney cut out at the beginning by this woman that like harvests organs and she needs like injected because our like she's like fucking hooked on drugs and all the rest and she's like a surgeon she is the mother in Parasite. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking at the the cast now. Oh wow. yeah, she's the she's the mother in Parasite. I'm sure she is anyway. Um, and once again, just it's just a genius bit of casting. I don't like said, like Parasite to me is, and to me up until that point, it was once upon a time in Hollywood was my favorite movie of 2019, and then Parasite coming in one over at the end. So. Um, fucking so that is a is a, t- a 2020 release for me technically yeah and it's it's yeah it's my i'm, I'm in the same this year. yeah i saw it yeah. this year but i thought it was uh phenomenal and yeah but all right let me let me hit you with um a movie i know you've seen now <laughs> yeah but i dearly love <laughs> yeah is the crazy bastard child of a sea shanty <laughs> and mermaid come called the lighthouse uh-huh uh which i i fucking love this movie so much duncan it is mm-hmm. it like this movie is deceptively classy mm-hmm. because the whole movie is just about two guys who want to fuck each other so bad mm-hmm. and just don't so they go crazy with cum <laughs> i mean am i wrong 
No, no, you, 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 you are, you are not wrong in what you say. The movie doesn't hide that either. There are a couple of scenes that, like, damn near directly, directly spill it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it, the lighthouse is fucking incredible. It's the, like a, uh, as the a master stroke of of just like the the, fu- the we said it before the fucking balls on Robert Eggers by the way to do that as a movie like in a weird aspect ratio um, black and when, white four three go fuck yourself yeah, <laughs> that's literally it uh, once again sticking true to the the you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna do an authentic dialogue which means some of you won't have a fucking clue what's happening that's fine I don't care um so like the only thing that's missing from that movie is an interrogation of a monkey um <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a full circle yeah but the 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 you can see watching this movie and I think we should in a lot of respects be slightly mournful but at the same time I now feel I don't need to see it of what could have been with his adaptation of Nosferatu. Like, yeah. like, he doesn't need to make that movie now. That, like, the 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 waves of German expressionism, specifically in the light and specifically on William Defoe's face, that massive, like, monologue that he comes out with when, like, Robert, Robert Pattinson's like that, our Pattinson's is like, you know, I don't like your cooking. And he's like, oh, but tell me you like my lobster. Oh, my God. And he's like that. And then he starts talking about how he'll be struck down by by Poseidon and he's fucking innards fed to like crow like just goes in this huge thing and the light underneath his face and I'm like that this is the cabinet of Dr. Caligari honestly just everything about it is is tearing itself apart with um, German expressionism and now he's done that on screen I don't need to see Nosferatu like done by him I I, mean, I, thought, I agree with you. I would still watch it in a heartbeat. Oh, I would mean. like... See, if you told me I could watch it now, I would fucking hang up on you, Bo, as much as I love you. <laughs> I would fucking hang up on you and go and watch it. Yeah. But yeah, he's, he, he obviously, that, that project sounded like it was in a bit of development hell, and so he went off and just did his version of a... Like a, 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 a if it's a, it's a poor, that, a, like a, an adaptation of a, a short short story by Poe, I believe, and he just fleshed it out, him and his brother, I think, um, fleshed out the story into something more, I think it's originally started as diary entries um, uh, by the Keeper of a Lighthouse, and what they've done is they've just extended it out. But there are so many bits that are just, like, mind-blowingly good. Like, there's something, I mean, it goes into lynch territory, it fucking, it it doesn't just go, it just wades in, (laughs) like, to fucking lynch territory. As if it, it was always supposed to be there. Um, the, the, my only negative, my only movie, is that our Pats can't decide where he's from because some of the time he's talking it is a kind of neutral esque American accent, and then other times there are shades of Boston in it. Yeah, and then like it's, it's the only thing. It's the only thing in the movie. The rest of that movie is front to back immaculate and ballsy as fuck yeah like act like on just the the confidence and if you get a chance e24 the film company that obviously handled distribution for the lighthouse have a podcast and i don't know if you know this uh but there is a podcast episode they do what they do is they tend to pick two directors that have movies coming out from their catalogue um, and then they'll pair them up and the directors have a conversation. A24 last year put out an episode where Robert Eggers um, has a little sit down and a chat, an elongated chat with Ari Aster and they just talk about the fact that in the same year, Midsommar and The Lighthouse are coming out. <laughs> That's, I will I will get on that. Um... It's, it's fucking, it's like, and the two of them are like, it's the first time the two of them have met. <laughs> Like oh, properly, man. and they're just like that, dude. I saw your, I saw Midsummer at some screening or whatever, and I was just blown away. And he's like that. Listen, I saw the lighthouse, and I was like, this is, this is as close to art as you'll ever. You know, like, just like the two of them just totally geek out on each other and talk about their influences and what, like, what led them to do that. And it's an insight. And I'd listened to that before I'd seen the lighthouse, and even their conversation not prepared me for the lighthouse. Even you sitting there saying you need rubber underwear, um, did not. 
it did not do justice to how captivating that movie is from start to finish it flew in i could have spent a, i could have spent another week with them there time gets lost it's like the way the characters even see at one point it's like that it, it you know is this how long this do you think weeks? you've been here yeah all that stuff is just nuts and then it's i was so starting good. to i was sitting there thinking to myself how long have i been watching this movie <laughs> yeah like, like your, your whole concept is it totally absorbs you in and yeah it, it's the it is he to me, a true, true watermark of where the genre has gone in the last five, six years. Like if you if you want about like these movies, like It Falls start coming in and Get Out and you know The Witch and uh, Hereditary and Midsummer and the fact that we're getting these movies now, I like it feels like all those movies have just been put down like paving stones to allow uh, the lighthouse to make its way to the cinema. I saw it in a multiplex cinema. <laughs> like, I saw it in a multiplex cinema um, in Glasgow in a room that would have held, um, what, about 500 patrons? And there was only like 20 people there. 500 patrons. And he got a proper full cinema release in the UK. And that, to me, speaks volumes to, of where we are now. Because five years ago, that would have played in a small indie theatre. Uh, it would have been one or two showings, and that would have been it done. And not now. It's just, it, but it fucking blows my mind that the world that we live in now is, is like, it's, it's amazing. It's, it, it's one of the, if, if In Fabric was the most unique experience that I had last year, the Lighthouse is certainly the most unique experience I've had watching a film this year. Yeah, it it is a movie that is its own world, and mm -hmm. and I'm like you. I wish I could just live among amongst the rocks and and Willem Dafoe's lobster uh, for a little while. So, <laughs> um, anything else, Duncan? You wanna you wanna bring up before we get the fuck out of here? Um, uh, so I will have a lot more movies that I will be able to speak about over the next coming weeks i've got i've got a few things that are are in the the, the pipeline in terms of movies that I've, I've been really looking forward to and i'm going to glasgow fright fest in early march and that festival opens with the the new movie by the team behind the endless so oh right I really, so that's i think yeah, that's the opening movie so um you know i'm in for a good time <laughs> yeah think. yeah please i mean if it turns out to be yet another sequel to <laughs> resolution the resolution <laughs> i'm gonna be extraordinarily happy but uh, I said the premise sounds amazing it's that about you know paramedics who attend some i think it's like a some crime scene uh, oh, and get dragged God. into some sort of hypnotic so some drug that when you take it it appears to and be a hallucinogen that maybe opens portals to other worlds. And I'm like, that, yes, oh, to all of that. <laughs> give, me, give me that. Um, it's their biggest movie. I think it's Jamie Dornan, um, the guy from the fall TV show in those uh, 50 Shades of Greys mm -hmm. movies. He's he's one of the main guys in it. So they they have arrived. It's, it seems like there's money being spent on this one. And it's uh, but there's another couple of movies that are in there as well that like genuine that this I would say to Liam who I was recording with earlier that uh, every year I've done Fright Fest, I can predict the ones that I think are gonna be really good. And there's quite a few that I'm using on that, right? This can go either way. This year's list, there's maybe about two films that I think look kind of sketchy to very good and everything else on the festival list looks really good so yeah you'll be hearing from me in time excellent excellent all right well uh i'll tell you what guys um i think that's gonna do it for this round of duncan and bo come correct slash duncan and bo get terrified um <laughs> sort of th this put that out. to bed <laughs> yeah yeah so look we're gonna be back in a month's time with, yes uh with more movies and we're gonna come up with some dumb shit to do that maybe is a little bit off our regular format, but should yeah. be fun. So yeah, we're, we're like it's probably worth stressing that like um, 
well, like we've done a we've done a lot of podcasts in the last three years. We've covered like a lot of TV shows and done a lot of episodes. And this year we're gonna not take the foot off the pedal. It's just we are gonna move into a, a slightly more relaxed output. And yes. I think we said that like maybe about one a month or something. So we'll, it's unlikely we will be deep diving into things like if you were expecting Duncan and Bogle to Westworld season three. Um, we're not going to be. We'll talk about it, as you say, but yes. we're not. We're not forensically examining that. We'll probably we'll take this year to just to find ourselves again, Bo, and then you never know what next year will bring. So absolutely, absolutely, and uh, but yeah, we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to continue to do stuff, and because we're we're not beholden to a specific format or show, mm -hmm. um, it, it's going to be fun to do some stuff that just whatever like it's gonna be entertaining to us yeah life yeah. is like a box of chocolates boy i don't know if you've heard this before you never know what you're gonna get oh that is pretty good <laughs> you you should use that I, i'm gonna oh, you're smart <laughs> um so folks that is this episode of duggan and Bo Come correct uh we'll be back in a month's time to do more goofy shit until then say good night duggan good night duggan <laughs> I think that's what you said, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's right.